Right, so I'm John Bawate. Asante uh, Nisana. I'm I'm pleased to be welcomed here today. I gave a talk in 2019, which was the beginning, at least for me, of sharing some ideas about the the growth of the Swahili uh, imaginary, really the development of the Swahili imaginary, and the way in which uh, art and uh, visual culture was was spreading. So we're continuing with that idea today, but actually in a more focused way because the uh, the emphasis is upon contemporary installation art, which comes under this um, category of post-colonial, post-modern. We're moving way beyond, uh, if you know uh, East African art, uh, tinga tinga and tourist type art, and into art which is very much uh, international and global. Installation refers to uh, the entire space is being used uh, to uh, really to help make one message or to create uh, one message. Now, what we're going to do is to compare two different installations that currently are in East Africa. When uh, Francesca Faye spoke at last year's uh, Baraza, she was speaking primarily about diaspora artists. And now I realized myself, what I said uh, earlier on, very much focused on diaspora artists, but we're talking about two uh, projects and uh, projects which have led to exhibitions, uh, which have shown recently in Nairobi, in the case of the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute, which has only been created in 2019. Uh, and the old Moshi project, uh, which was established in East Africa in 2019 uh, also, but actually started in Berlin. In both cases, these are dedicated spaces, new spaces for showing uh, contemporary postmodern art. So it's a critical intervention in East Africa, not what's happening outside of East Africa, because there's a whole lot happening uh, there too in the terms of the world of art. In terms of Swahili, of course, my interest is, you know, I start with the common denominator, which is the kanga, and we move into other spheres of, of, of making. So uh, the Sio, uh, Kaspali Siowia Kiambi, Siowia Kiambi is a Kenyan artist. Her uh, an, She's created an, an acronym for herself, which is Kaspali, which comes from her uh, joint or her, uh, what is the word she uses actually? The, really her woven or meshed uh, personality, her nation, nationalities, which are Kenyan and German. Kaspa uh, is clown, trickster in German, and her pale is taken from Swahili, a meeting there. And she's used uh, Swahili a bit in her uh, recent exhibition, which is what Angelica will be speaking about uh, after I do the introduction, and then I'll go on and talk about Manking Meli Remains, which has been one of my passions and focuses in terms of East African art um, for about the last, what is it now, four years? Uh, I've been, to, when I spoke in 2019, I hadn't visited the old Moshi site. I have now been twice, and I've also taken girls from the school where I taught on Kilimanjaro in the 1960s, which is where the Swahili comes from, or what's left of it. Uh, and we've been bringing girls to visit this particular project, uh, A-level history students, you'll hear more about that. That, that exhibition is a combination of uh, old Moshi cultural tourism, which had actually started before the project uh, gained much more uh, girth from a uh, German, actually Berlin, the, uh, it's the German decolonization uh, project called uh, Flynn works in Berlin. I've given you uh, underneath the, these two images, one of from Nairobi and the other from uh, Moshi, uh, websites and uh, places where you can do more checking. Basically, this talk is, or the slides like uh, Jonathan's, are, are this talk is too long, uh, and I hope that you will ask us for a copy of the PowerPoint, which we can uh, send to you. I'm EC6 at SOAS. Uh, for some reason, I didn't, because I'm no longer teaching here, perhaps I didn't put in my uh, my address, and Angelica is AB17 at SOAS. So if you write to either one of us, we will send you the uh, compressed copy of the PowerPoint so that you can have our references and some of the ideas which I simply will not have time uh, to, to develop during the talk. Okay, so we go to the next one, please. 
this is <clears throat> this is the background, a bit of the background in terms of expanding the Swahili imaginary with art uh, and visual culture, I, which, uh, at least in my mind, uh, I talked about in 2018, dealing particularly with visual art. Uh, and uh, to my surprise, when I re rethought about that event, they were indeed uh, women artists that I was talking about, which is what Francesca uh, built on uh, last year. The, I won't say any more about that. Uh, in the center is the Swahili, uh, sorry, is the Kanga, which is probably the iconic uh, in terms of broad and general uh, audience, iconic uh, symbol or sign of Swahili culture. But when you look more deeply, uh, I think historically, well, Swahili actually, the excuse me, the uh, Kanga does have history back to the late 1800s. But much older history, of course, comes from the art architecture. And there are at least four World Heritage sites that when we're talking about Swahili visual culture, we need to consider. And if we go, to, of course, these are the stone towns, uh, and there's been so much written about them, and then their countercultures and Swahili people who are not living in stone towns who also have uh, their visual culture. An article I particularly liked was one by Farouk Topan, Professor Topan, who might be here this afternoon, I hope, where he spoke about small objects which carried uh, aesthetic meaning uh, for Swahili people. And the two examples he gave were a fly whisk and an incense burner. Uh, and that article uh, I found very useful just in terms of, of measuring popular ideas of Swahili culture with maybe core Swahili ideas. The, the metaphor I use for that is actually roots and roots. Roots, and this comes, uh, comes from various people, but Gavin Genji, a South African artist, is where I first heard the idea uh, mooted, you know, decades ago, literally. It's the idea of what is the core, and when we think particularly of Swahili core culture, it's like a rhizome root, like a ginger root, has many different sources. And I think this is one of the things that makes it difficult to actually grasp what Swahili means. And then there's so many different extensions. Uh, Francesca went off very much in the uh, feminist direction, which, which is what the evidence actually shows. Uh, but there are many other artists who are using uh, elements of Swahili, either core Swahili or the more extended kind of Swahili feelings uh, in, in their work. So they'll leave the Kanga part there, just to say there's a lot. We, last year, we do, um, Angelica presented ever so briefly the spreadsheet that we worked on together, which is online. And then last year's Baraza, besides uh, talking about feminist uh, Swahili extensions, you had, the, as your guest, I, I recall and saw actually online, Abdul Razak Gurna. And just to point out, these are two uh, diaspora, uh, Lubaina Hamid, whom uh, Francesca was talking about, and uh, Professor Professor Hamid, uh, Professor Gurna, both absolute stars for Swahili in, in the international circuit, in the diaspora. And what we are talking about today is back uh, in East Africa and rooted in East Africa very much. So now it's Angelica's turn. Uh, excellent. And I see, you can say, you can stay here. Can, can yeah, you share can. the it's fine. I stand. Uh, so thank you so much, expert, for the um, this uh, um, introduction. I just want to say that I am just do giving now a very small intervention on a broader presentation by Esbeth Court, who is our expert in East African art at SOA. So I am a sort of a supporting act, uh, as they say. And uh, I will just very briefly um, intervene here uh, with presenting you a little bit more detail uh, the exhibition that I was lucky to to see in Nairobi, thanks to, um, again, Esbe introducing me to uh, uh, the work of Sylvia Kiambi. Uh, I was really uh, very much impressed by uh, the exhibition. And also with Sylvia, we also hosted a talk at SOAS. That was my first, actually, interaction mm -hmm. with her. It was an online event where she presented her um, exhibition. Um, and then after that, I was um, I was lucky enough to be able to visit uh, the Nairobi Contemporary Institute of Art um, in Nairobi, with a new institute uh, founded uh, uh, also by others, but including uh, Michael Armitage, who is a leading uh, Kenyan um, so international artist. 
Um, so just in, 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 in brief, because I don't want to take too much time, I just wanted to, to sort of introduce you to, uh, so Silvia Chiambi, as I said, she's a, uh, an international artist, um, of dual uh, heritage. She's born in Kenya, uh, but she also has a um, German uh, heritage. And um, she is now uh, one of the sort of leading, I would say, uh, contemporary artist uh, uh, from Kenya who um, has been um, showing her work across uh, many different platforms. Um, uh, both on the continent and internationally. Uh, just to point out, she's exhibited, so to the highlight was the Biennale in Venice, but she also exhibited at 154 and many other international uh, art fair. Uh, so just going uh, uh, into the actual exhibition, um, uh, Caspale. Caspale is a very interesting character, uh, and as uh, Esbeth has already mentioned, uh, Caspale is uh, um, a sort of metaphor and uh, um, it symbolizes uh, many different elements in um, um, in what uh, Sylvia is trying to convene with the art. Um, and just to sort of add that actually is, um, Sylvia is a multi-dimensional artist. She uses various um, ways of expressing um, her work through, so it's a multimedia art, um, artist. And um, uh, so with this body of work, uh, which as you can read here, it began in 2018 in the um, region of Usambara in Tanzania, as you know, Usambara Mountains, um, and then uh, expanded into a series of intervention that um, COVIA uh, uh, conducted in, the, in Nairobi city. And so through the uh, use of Caspale, she's trying to sort of uh, come and um, deal with um, issues of trauma and violence and um, historical um, um, inequalities um, by uh, sort of using um, Caspale as the... Uh, also, again, another important element that we want to convene here in this forum of Baraza is how uh, COE is using the Swahili imaginary to express her art, and in particular, um, in this uh, uh, evolution of Caspale. Uh, so she's taking Caspale, this character that she sort of embodied, uh, and um, she, as you can see in the image before, she's embodied by wearing herself the mask of Caspale and going around uh, different spaces where she's actually confronting um, uh, the historical uh, violence um, of the um, of, of her experience. Um, so through this map, um, basically that again is also uh, written in Swahili. So another um, important element is how she's using the Swahili language um, to convene um, um, its artistic um, messages. And um, and then the three sort of element that um, um, emerge from the map. I don't have so much time. Perhaps uh, Esbeth is definitely going to so, so say a few more things. Uh, yes. So I'll have to sort of speed up. Uh, but just to say, just to sort of uh, make you think about three elements that really uh, uh, spring out from the map, from the work of, of from the representation of Caspale by Silvia Chiambi is um, uh, obviously so uh, Caspale the rabbit, uh, the metaphor that is very much present into the Swahili um, imaginary, um, as well as the fact that Caspale comes from the mangrove. So the mangrove, again, is another very uh, symbolic element, which we can, sorry, I just jump here quickly because I wanted to show you uh, the mangrove on the uh, right hand side. And then these are the sort of three big elements that we feel represent uh, the Caspale, the tricksters, and what she's trying to, to tell us. And finally, also the performative, the performance uh, element of uh, um, uh, of the practice and the fact that she's using a sort of some uh, reference to masquerade and to this idea of um, masquerade and um, sort of more traditional um, art. And so so the Swahili tradition, the language, Swahili language, how it comes into Sylvia Kiambi's work is what we were trying to sort of convene here today. And then looking at her as a, she's an international artist, she's, uh, you know, sort of a yeah, Kenyan based, German base and in that sense, but she has these references to Swahili culture, imaginary um, and history, and then also Kenyan history and violence. So uh, because, um, yeah, we have running out of time. So I leave it here, perhaps later on. Uh, yeah. And then this also, again, uh, other images of the exhibition. The exhibition is very, very moving, is very... Um, intense and you know it brings out uh, i mean sylvia is really pushing boundaries 
uh, that you know has not really been pushed uh, that far in um, in the Kenyan society, I would say. But now, basically, I just pass it back on to Elsbeth mm -hmm. to continue on the Mangi Meli, which is the second example of the sort of slightly different, but to some extent, the idea was to bring to you very uh, a very different, exactly. But what? just the idea of what? like same, located same located within East Africa and uh, and with, with certain connection. Mm -hmm. So I'll pass it back on to Elsbeth, and then we can continue it in the Q and A. Thank you. So, okay. Elizabeth, yeah, three minutes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So this uh, this this will be a real race. Uh, Mangi Rally remains uh, is a collaborative transnational uh, project that concerns restorative history and the repatriation of human remains. Now, the restorative history part is extremely meaningful to me because when I taught East African history, we didn't teach this. We taught about Chief Mkwawa. We taught about Maji Maji, but I was living on Kilimanjaro. We actually were doing oral history, but this, I miss this. So in a way, it's me making up for my past, perhaps by my interest in this project. Now, the, uh, no, that's three, too fast. I think you touched. Uh, the, all, the, the Mze that you see in this photograph is the grandson of Mangi Meli, who was uh, um, executed by the Germans in 1900, along with 18 of his uh his helpers or his headmen from different parts of Kilimanjaro. So they had a collaborative in, uh, it was in 1891, they had a coll collaborative fight and they defeated the Germans. And then they came back, the Germans came back and defeated him. Not only did they defeat him, but they took the Mele family land. So what you're seeing now, what you'll see on the next page actually, uh, is the land uh, where the memorial is, uh, which is still government land in Tanzania, but it became it started out as being German colonial land. Uh, on the other page, still back one, so you have one more picture of Mangimeli when he was young. Uh, the other direction. Yeah. No, the other direction. This one. Yeah. Right. I just wanted you to see Mangimeli when he was a young man. Uh, and the text, which is in this book booklet, is in Swahili, English, and German. Uh, Mostly you're using Swahili when we're talking about it. The first time I went, we used English, but ever since then, we, the whole discussion has been in Swahili, although the reports that I get are actually written in English. That's him. The text itself is quite poetic, and it's one of the reasons why I like the, the booklet that they prepared to go with this uh, exhibition. And this it's an entire experience that you have. That's partially why we're calling this installation art. The young man uh, who leads the cultural tourism in in um, Boshi, uh, commissioned this sculptor of Mwangi Mali to go under the tree on which he was hung or hanged uh, back in, to the, back it's, that was actually in 1900. The tree itself is unusual. It's an acacia, acacia tree, it's an umganga in, in Swahili, I forget now, uh, but because at that altitude, usually these trees don't grow. And it was where the Baraza was. So not only did the Germans take the land, they sort of ruined the tree, and at least in, not quite ruined it, but they made it less social place to be. The tree itself, I would say, is a witness to all this history. And what I've done is picked out sections of the catalog or the booklet, which fit with the stories that go uh, with the images. The next one? Oh, this, we're already on the next one. This is inside the exhibition uh, and why it's an installation. It's using many different kinds of of um, images and media, uh, uh, vintage photographs, which are a bit like the ones you see from Zanzibar, except they're more violent. I mean, they actually do have this trauma history in them. Uh, these are uh, students visiting the three sections. The three sections that deal with my Mayisha, the life, Kifo, the death, and a word in Swahili that I have trouble pronouncing. That means that they're after. The three aspects of Mangi Welly's existence that we would like to acquaint students with. So the students would be, or any of the visitors actually, would be looking at the vintage photographs. They have already visited the tree, and then they see this wonderful back one. Sorry, back. we need to go. They see to this go. video, which you can get online from Flynn Works in Berlin. It's absolutely charming. When the students write up what they see, they're really taken by the video, which gives the life and a bit of the thereafter of... Um, of Mangi Wally, and it's, <clears throat> it's screened into a broken pot, 
broken pot is traditionally where you would bury or uh, a second burial uh, okay. uh the dead uh in a uh, chaga culture now we can move on uh, this i can't really talk through because we don't have time yeah. but it gives you a comparison of the two installations mostly how they're alike and believe me, they're really extraordinary. I've been looking at art in East Africa, again, for like 60 years. And we haven't had these kinds of spaces like the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute provides, or indeed uh, this tiny little place at Old Moshi uh, in Moshi. They're beautiful white cubes in the sense of modernist white cube and so forth and so on. And they're dealing with the traumas. This is the last one. This is a bonus. Uh, those of you who live in London or even maybe visiting for the day, if you want the installation of the century, so to speak, this is uh, Professor Ellen Atsui's work, a uh, very, very famous Ghanaian artist at this point who has taken over and reimagined uh, the Tate Turbine Hall as a ship. And you have the big sails, you have actually a wall, and the one in the middle if you walk in the direct walk towards Southwark Tube Station, it becomes a globe. It's free. Uh, it's really worth your time on a rainy day or maybe any other day uh, to see this incredible work by a Ghanaian artist. Mm -hmm. Little to do with East Africa, but certainly a lot to do. Thank I must you. stop. A lot Excellent. to do with what installation art is and where African contemporary art is now, literally. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. you both, uh, very much. Fantastic talk. I think we have to petition next year for Baraza to be a two-day event. Yes. So that we can have a bit more time for uh, each of our presenters. Uh, our, our next presenter is our very own um, Ija Hajivayanis, um, who I believe your slides are here and ready to go. Yeah, we need to just pick it. The video is ready, right? The one? The video, uh, yeah, the, the video is ready. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let me just open it. Um, what I'm doing now. It's a PDF. So can I have it wide, wide? So it oh, it's a PDF. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Maybe I need to. Classic, yeah. 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 Is that better? Or how, how, could, how should I do it? No. No. It's quite down. I think it's because we need to, can you just open it proper? Hmm. I think, I, so it's, let me save it. Okay. Yeah, let's save it. You know, I should do that. I need to put this over, I don't. From here, maybe. Okay. Can you make sure we share it with the yeah. Zoom? With a free tile to yeah, maybe need to share. 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 Are you recording? Yeah. What is it? Oh, this. This one. Okay. So yes, um, now I welcome Ija Hadjoyanis. Yeah. Yes, okay. So I should probably time myself so I don't um, overrun my, my time. Um, so <clears throat> my presentation actually is part of a monograph that I am working um, with Salah Hamdani, who is here with us today. It is on the life of her mother, Salama Binti Rubea, and this is the this is Salama Binti Rubea, who was born in 1912, and she spent her childhood in Kilwa Kivinje and her adulthood in Zanzibar. Um, although she did travel between the two spaces uh, quite a lot. Now the monograph actually draws from recorded conversations between Salama and Salha, and sometimes between myself as well and, and my sister because we are the grandchildren. Um, so these, the, 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 con the conversations that I'm going to be, uh, that, that I'm working with now really, took place in 1991, when um, uh, sort of like both Salama and Salha were at um, the deathbed of um, Salama's oldest son. His name was Adurahman Guy, 
and he founded um, Zanzibar Communist Party in the 60s. Um, so a lot was discussed, as you would imagine, and uh, also recorded with a tape recorder. And um, so, I mean, sort of like having found these cassettes, we thought it was a really good idea to try and write down what was discussed and, and hopefully like share these narratives. And so, um, because I, I thought, I mean, we thought it was important since they actually give an in individual perspective that then feeds into the global sort of like narratives of communities that flourished on the, on, on the Indian Ocean. Um, and in this presentation today, what I want to do is I want to explore um, ideas or these notions that, um, that Salama grew up with and largely notions of ethnicity and race. Um, and I think that through her narrative, um, we really see her own racialization and even that of the people around her. Um, and also we can see how others viewed her and maybe others who are like her, uh, which of course would then impact on the notion of the self. Um, and I sort of like, I, I think I want to say this, that since racialization actually is, 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 is a process which often tends to emerge from differentiation. And so uh, when differentiation happens in a meaningful way, you have this this sort of like recognition of the race of the ethnicity, um, and I have three examples that I want to go through with you today, and sort of like my hope really is for you maybe to feedback and let me know if I'm on the right track or I've just made everything up. Um, do I move down? No, sorry. Oh, now you've seen all my whole thing. Okay. So the, the first event that I want to mention um, sort of like um, seems to come back quite a lot in, in her recordings. And um, I think it has a very strong imprint on, um, on how she came to understand herself. Um, the incident took place around 1917 um, when the British were fighting the Germans in Kilwa. Um, and so Kilwa is, you can probably see sort of like where you have Kilwa Masoko that's slightly around there. Um, and so just for like uh, background information, a few sort of like um, months maybe before this event in 1916, it was rumored that a huge war was uh, making its way into Kilwa Kivinje, which is where she was located. And, and Salama, who was almost four at the time, sort of like um, has memories or maybe has been told about the general feeling of disbelief, you know, that um, no one could really dismantle the Germans. It just can't be. It's a mighty force. And um, even the kids would play around and um, and copy this uh, this man that they would call Simba wa Africa. Um, and interestingly, uh, sort of like history tells that, that this man does exist, and his name is Paul Emil von Leto Forbeck. The Germans can correct me later. Uh, so literally the, the Lion of Africa. Um, and he was fighting a, a guerrilla war in the then Dutch East Africa, so East Africa. So, I mean, Salama sort of like uh, mentions hearing that people were dying somewhere up north, like a lot of them were dying, and I would imagine it would be around Tanga, possibly. And, and so this news trickling down into Kilwa meant that some families did decide to evacuate, um, especially women and children, from the coast where they were located into the, the, the interior. And, um, and, and Salama's parents, um, Lord, Salama's parents were really uh, no different. So, so Salama grew up um, with her grandfather and, and, and her father, although her father passed away when she was eight, uh, and her mother, who was with her throughout her, her life, really. Um, so the grandfather is, is the patriarch of, of the family, of the household, and he decides that the women and the children have to evacuate to a place called Kisangi, which is somewhere in, in, in the continent, sort of. Um, and Salama has to be carried at the back of a man called Shomari. And, and this man seems to have worked for Wana Mahfouz for many, many years. Um, but before the journey, um, there's, there's a process that takes place where Salama is completely camouflaged with black suit. 
So in Swahili, we call this machinesy um, because it was feared that she had a fair complexion and she could easily have been confused for a child who had German ancestry. And I think this fear was very much uh, sort of like well-founded because um, we know that children in uh, the then Tanganyika, North West Africa, who are, who, whose mothers were African, um, were taken away from these mothers because the mothers were seen as unfit to raise them. And so they were raised in, in convents all across the region. Um, so that you probably heard of the Simbazi convent in Dar es Salaam, Ushirombo in Tabora, Kivungiro in Lushoto, and Tosamaganga in Iringa, among others. And so this fear is actually a sort of like well-founded, so to say. Now, Salama remembers this experience as the first time when she became aware of being lighter than the other children in the grandfather's compound. Um, and, and so, I mean, Kilwa was one of these sort of like uh, centers that exist at the intersection, right, between continental Africa and the maritime cultures of the Indian Ocean, where you have Zanzibar, um, uh, Pemba, etc., uh, Mafia, etc. Um, and so she is she is the result, really, of a coming together of, of these cultures. Her mother was Mgindo, and uh, her father was from Yemen, so Mshihiri, as we call them in Swahili. And the Mashinzi process, um, as I, I want to call it, I think is a process through which differentiation takes place in a meaningful way for her. Um, and I think it stands really as a momentous sort of like time when she understood that she was different uh, because no other child in the household had the Mashinzi apart from her. Um, her grandfather and, and, and her father were, were Yemeni, as I said before, and they deeply identified as, as Arab, uh, which of course has an effect on Salama. And also her mother, her name was Binti Mbwana, was a very proud Mgindo. I mean, she always sort of like took the chance to remind them that um, the Mgindo had joined the Wamatumbi during the Maji Maji resistance. And so they're very strong folk, you know. Um, at home, she spoke Kiswahili. This is the language that she understood and, and used um, at home. But of course, she also understood Kingindo and also Kiarabu. I mean, Arabic, but she could not converse in these two languages. She just understood them. Her language, we can almost say, was the in-between language, really, that was in, in the region, Kiswahili. Um, and so I would, I, would, I would really say that this would be my first example of um, of this in-betweenness, of her realizing that there was there was difference. Um, the second, let me come down. So this, uh, sorry, this is her. She was drawn um, when she was in her thirties there, but by hand, by a man called um, George, I think, or, or something. I mean, we can check this later. But this took five minutes by chalk, and uh, and she kept it forever. Um, now, the second differentiation, I think, um, is linked to the locales, the spaces that she occupied, as is the third as well, which I will give in a bit. So in the 20th century, when Salama is in Kilwa Kivinje, the town is divided into these racial sort of like uh, quarters, right? Um, and this is the result of the German urban planning, where the cost consists of houses um, that are sort of like... Um, that were occupied by the by the colonial administrators, really. You have this triangle almost, with uh, the, the base being the coast, where 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 you have the the boma, which is uh, this 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 photo here, and then you have the customs house. There was a there was a hospital, a governor's house, and all these were by the waterfront, and they were surrounded by greenery, so largely minazi, coconut coconut palms, yeah. Um, as you can see, the, the Boma has a three-story, and it also housed the post office and the police as well. Uh, it was built in 1891 for those interested in, I don't know, architecture and all these things. Um, and it was the most important building in the area, um, literally the, the German headquarters, really. Um, and it is the place, interestingly, it stood at the place of where was the Zanzibar uh, governor, all sort of like fort, which was demolished to sort of like bring this. At the back of this boma, you have the barracks and the prison, and uh, there were also cannons such as this one. And I think was this photo taken by my student Ishmael? I'm not sure, I think. Uh, so I need to sort of like acknowledge that. Um, 
but um so she so in, in sort of like uh, in my research interestingly i found um sorry I, I went too quickly um i found that in the in, in this european side of town there was a doctor's house there was a telegraph and there were shops that were run by greeks but Salama does not mention any of these things at all. These are things that um, I'm not very sure if she knew about or if they just didn't, I mean, she just had no clue about them. I mean, it was in a side of town that she did not really have any access to. Um, and uh, But the most exciting thing that was in this quarter were street was street lighting, where every evening a man went around and hung a lamp on the road. And this was actually present in her side of town, um, which was uh, the sort of like uh, the commercial quarter where you have the Arabs and the Indians largely. Um, and um, sort of like, I think, uh, according to the Dar es Salaam archives, in 1886, there were 242 Indians um, in this quarter. So the houses tend to have these arch doors and you normally have the shop and the residential area at the same spot. Um, now, what's interesting, though, like, OK, for me and where differentiation really happens is that when Salama was born and until she was four, her grandfather's house was actually at the European side of town um, by the sea. But then uh, you, you have uh, sort of like this urban planning where the Arabs and the Indians could not be at the coast anymore. And so they were moved to the uh, commercial side of town. And so, I mean, her grandfather did try to sort of like um, argue his case. He, he bought the space, etc. But that wasn't really taken into consideration. And they move into this other side of town. And I think sort of like um, when, when you think of um, sort of like being shifted from a space that you've occupied to one where there are people like you, you can see this differentiation taking place there. So I've got four minutes to go. I'm going to have to rush through. I think I did I didn't time myself very well as well. Um, so just so this is the sort of like, uh, and this was taken by Ishmael as well. You can see I was very dependent on Ishmael throughout my my, my thing. So this was the the, the the commercial side of town. Now the, the last um, sort of like um, example I, I take is from Zanzibar, um, and she really settled in Zanzibar in um, sort of like after marriage largely, and um, so she, she lived in an area called uh, Mkunazini. And Umkunazini is in the stone town. And I think we all know that this space was quite racialized. Um, so, so, for example, I know this is quite de debated, but we did have like the uh, urban planners, like, for example, Henry Lancaster, uh, who put pro pro proposals for the stone town to have an Indian, Arab and European quota. And for everybody who was native to go to the Ngambo side. So, I mean, this has been very well documented by many people, including Laura Fair and Abdul Sharif and everybody else. Um, but what it what this has done, I think it has also left um, a, a, like a very huge legacy whose narrative um, has, has lived on in people's minds, colonial legacy. Um, a legacy that seems that, that is quite strong in, in Salama's uh, okay, narratives. I think sort of like in her recordings, she, she does have a geographical location of people in Stone Town. So, for example, she would say where she lived in Mkunazini was the area where uh, sort of like designated for the Sunni Muslims. Um, and she mentions names such as uh, Akina Lodhi, Akina Shamsu, and Akina Mamlo, uh, who were sort of like the, the, the families that were meant to be there since they were Sunni Muslim. But there were also others. And these others are people like the Kulatein, the Hamdani, Bakathir, and Said Mansab, etc. She would also talk about uh, Malindi and talk about the, uh, this being the area which was designated for the Yemeni Arab, uh, especially Funguni. Uh, there were, of course, exceptions, uh, uh, such as um, there was a Kibrawanese family, the Al Hitimi, who were in Kiponda. But sort of like the other ethnicities are really um, uh, an exception, really. Um, now, Salama's narrative places Africans who are originally from the continent, uh, so Bara, and for her, largely from Kilwa, as really being the poorest. She knew of many who had come from Kilwa, who were her friends, and they worked as matopasi, so street sweepers, or wachukuzi uh, carriers. And they lived in areas such as Makadara, which was really seen as 
<laughs> beyond ngambo um but she also talks obviously about sort of like uh, other indians such as the gorolana wind indians who would collect an- onions um at the at the harbor and these onions would have fallen off jute sacks and so they were also quite poor but i think the difference really is that uh, some of these sort of like um people did have their community supporting them like you had the nyumba zabure where they they could okay reside and and all that so what i'm trying to say is though, is um, what happens to Salama in Zanzibar is she is surrounded by people of various ethnicities, but there seems to be some kind of a blurring of, um, of these ethnicities, especially in Stone Town. And somehow through this blurring, she finds a space that she belongs, different from what happened when she was young in, in, in Kilwa. She is actually able to melt, I think, in a port where she fits in. And so like you find that despite the, the, these geographical racial lines, she is able to find an in-between space, particularly in, in Zanzibar. And, uh, and so she, she would have this Zokitarika, uh, with the other Wangindo and Wayao, etc., she can go to the matinee movies with the Indian ladies and uh, walk to Cooper with her children. So she's sort of like occupying various spaces, whether they were Indian, European, or African, etc. And um, and so just at the final word, I think I need to say that uh, everything I've talked about today happened in a colonial context. I can't talk about everything, but this is specifically linked to to Salama. So. And then we find that whether Kilwa or Zanzibar, although these were both Swahili states, but they were different. And the colonial state prioritized racial ethnic relations in both um, uh, spaces, but somehow it feels as if Kilwa probably had a more direct colonial rule. And so it was more entrenched. These racial lines were more entrenched than in Zanzibar. And Zanzibar's cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism possibly made the ethnic lines slightly blurred especially for the inhabitants of, St- of Stone Town. And um, I think maybe this is why Salama was able to embrace all ethnicities in Zanzibar, such as being Mgindo, Mwarabu, Mtuwa Mwambao, Mtuwa Visiwani, so all of which sort of like somehow merge into her being Mzanzibari. I hope this made sense because I was sort of like rushing through my thing. Um, this is actually, sorry, um, a painting of Zanzibar Stone Town that was done by Abrahman Hamdani, who happens to be my uncle. So I've really plugged in my family family today. <laughs> As you can see, thank you very much. Naitwa Mariam Muhammad Hamdani, ni mzaliwa wa Zanzibar, nimekulia na kusomea Zanzibar baadaye nilikwenda nje nikasomea shahada Uholanzi the Hague nimekwenda Tampere University nikwenda Marekani Ujerumani na nchi za Kiafrika uh, Egypt na Sudan na kisha sasa hivi karibuni alinifuata mkurugenzi ambaye baadaye alistaafu Chande akaniomba kwamba kama naweza niandike hadithi lakini wanataka hadithi zenye mkono wa wanawake Kwa hivyo mimi nikakubali lakini kwa bahati bahati alifika wakati akastaafu kabla hata sijapeleka ile hadithi. Kwa hivyo baada muda nikasema ah wacha ni ni ni, ni tarishe, ni andike uzuri filamu. Sababu so, nimeanza kuandika hizi hadithi ndogo ndogo kwa lengo kwamba ni andike kitabu. Niliona jinsi gani zamani wazee wazazi walezi walikuwa wanakaa karibu sana na watoto wao na kila mara unakuwa unaelekezwa hili unaelekezwa hili magharibi kisha ikilia honi tu kwanza honi manake ni jua linakuchwa ikilia mnakimbia mbio kwenda majumbani baada ya kunywa chai kudurusu na kufanya homework zenu tena mnatandika mkeka na kuja bibi kukupeni hadithi na bahati yako leo urudi mapema ungechelewa kuingia huko ndani ungekiona kilicho mtakanga manyoya kwa hivyo mimi nikasema mm, wacha hii film niipige kwa sababu hasa sasa Nimeona kwamba kuna udhalilishaji sana wa watoto na wanawake. Aka, kwa nipige mwana wangu hivyo? Kana adabu. Huyu ndo alosababisha ndoa zahara kuvunjika. Huyu mtoto ni fisadi. Tena ni fisadi sana. Umefanya nini? Mimi sijui hilo hadi jana na mbeni kachukua bali kwa mihamisi nikampeleke alo zahara. Ina maana wewe umekuwa kuwadi sasa? 
kwa bahati nzuri nilikuwa na kanga za zamani sana aliniachia eh, marehemu bibi yangu sote tulipewa lakini mimi zangu nilikuwa nimeziweka nimezificha najua mimi hodari wa kutunza vitu na halafu nimejaribu sana katika ile film kuingiza mambo ya zamani mambo ya zamani mapambo ya zamani makasha yale masinia man, ambavyo vitu vya shaba vilikuwa vinavutia Atafu, hata wale wanawake mitindo yao ya, ya nywele ilikuwa mitindo ya kama mashore lakini walikuwa hawatii masinga kama hivi sasa watu wote wanasinga watu wote waupe wa hata humjui nani mwarabu nani so mwarabu lakini zamani unahusudu hasa maana kila mtu na nywele zake uvaji wa tarbushi mwendo mfano kulikuwa wanaume wanakamata fimbo lakini fimbo ilikuwa sio 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 chombo ambacho kinamsaidia yeye ili a balance yani asianguke kile kilikuwa ni chombo cha nafshi wanakwenda wenyewe kwa mbwembwe wanatekisa mkono wao wenyewe wana 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 wana, 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 wana ile fimbo utausulu sasa kuwatazama na hata wanawake nao walivyokuwa wanavaa mabuibu ya kamba wanavaa wanapandisha juu lile buibui na nguo zao zilikuwa hazifiki mpaka chini zilikuwa zinafika kati kati ya mguu hata ngoma nimejaribu sana kurejesha ngoma ambayo imeachwa siku nyingi sana kupigwa kama lele mama na, na, na watu wameifurahia wame sana kuiona lele mama kuingiza na nani hii Maulidi ya Homo ilikuwa kwa tangu zamani vile vitu vyote nilivyoweka zamani vile kwa Wabdalahaji kwa sahibi ya Fumani tanga mpya nguo mpya mali mpya huyo anapita Mzazi ungali Wabdalahaji kwa sahibi ya Fumani kanga mpya nguo mpya mali mpya huyo anapita Wabdalahaji kwa sahibi ya Fumani kanga mpya mali mpya huyo anapita Salamu alaykum Waalaikum salam Fanya haraka nyingi ndani ina maana mimi nimenipata kwa ile babu kwa sababu ya mali kwa sababu ya pesa kwa sababu ya nyumba lo hivi mnajua mangame ambayo alikuwa akiyafanya hivi mnajua mangame ambayo alikuwa akinifanyia mimi kwa hivyo natatumai kwamba hii filamu mtaipenda na wengine itapokuoneshwa mtaweza kwenda kuyakalia I have a question to start with for the panel on for healing modern art. Um, you mentioned that one of the projects was based partly on research into the Amani Agricultural Research Station in northern Germany in that region. And I just wonder whether you could elaborate on that because well, firstly, it's a topic that simply cries out for research. Because a lot was invested in it and it kept going for a long time. And I, I believe that there was an anthropologist, Vesa Geisler, who started working on it some years ago, but I don't know, I don't know whether it ever came to fruition. I just wonder whether we know more about what the trauma is and how the attention that's yes, yes. Um, we didn't really go into the detail why Celia was at Amani. Uh, in her, actually, even on on the big evolution map of of uh, the story of the Caspal, she mentions that the, that institute was no longer working. She was there in relation to a project, uh, rather to a residency that was also at the Mark Museum uh, in Hamburg, and uh, it doesn't quite make sense. But she was looking at images which were in Germany of the Amani. Uh, Institute and indeed it postcards. And she was using some of these postcards to, to make her mark on them with this Caspal uh, postcard. So indeed, we know that Armani is not actually operating now, but she went back to have the experience 
of what the area looked like. And she mentions that perhaps the government of Tanzania will use it uh, for a research station someday. But she is aware of it, she's aware of that. It was part of her field work for uh, this invention of Kaspali. Kaspali, the actual mask, like uh, mask itself, comes from a Makonde mask, which is in uh, Amor. It's not quite the same, but it has references to some Gora, to rabbits, and to rabbit stories. If that helps. But thank you for, for picking us up on that. Let's see, other questions, comments? Yeah, uh, John, the, the images that you showed so clearly, so many of the images on the postcard so clearly speak to the history of slavery mm. in Zanzibar. And I just wondered if that is something that you will speak to in your project. Um, and then a comment on, on Ida's presentation. Ida, I, I mean, you, you, you mentioned it, sorry, I mean, it was kind of in passing, but also central to your paper about the consequences of forced removal. Um, and, and I just thought that perhaps. Well, I, I wondered kind of how central the trauma of forced removal is to this person's life history. And I asked that because in the South African experience, which I'm more familiar, so if you look at the history of forced removals in the 20th century, and certainly in life history, there's kind of a lot of oral history that's been done. Um, in, in the experiences of life history, forced removal stands out as the one event that people use to kind of separate their lives so people uh, certainly in South African lives, history of forced removal. People speak of their lives in the 20th century as the period before and after forced removal. Um, and it just struck me as something that uh, I just wondered how, if, if, you, if it's something you wanted to build up on in your paper. Um, there is no such point. I mean, the sense that the, the project is really just to try and create a repository. But, and then my my vision is is really just for others then to be able to use it in in how, however they see fit. But of course, there is a, a lot of um, imagery that speaks to that, and and that wouldn't be. I mean, I didn't really I didn't include some of the images, of course, many of the images that are there, but but they do exist. And also, interestingly, sort of quite distastefully, the way in which writers of the senders of the postcards have kind of uh, the, the images where there is a kind of a, a sort of clearly a, a, a sort of slave scene have sort of written sort of captioned it um uh almost like named the individuals but it's named with their friends or something just sort of some some kind of interaction with the images and things like that but yeah certainly it's a, it's a big part of it but um hopefully when even when the project, which is really just to create the repository, people would be able to do so many different things with it, however they, however they wish, but I'm sure that would be a big part of it. Yeah. I think, Wayne, I'll, I'll take your, your, your comment as, as a comment. Maybe like we can talk about that later. Like I'd love to learn more, because I've, I've only read about this to, for Australia and South Africa, and I do know that it happened in Tanzania, but I don't think we've written much about sort of like those mixed race children who are raised in these convents and no, uh, yeah. Thank you though. <clears throat> Do we have questions or more? Um yes, we have one. So yeah. Uh, okay, so I will be reading the question from the um online audience. We have a question from Stephen Xavier Casimo. Uh, it says, uh, how difficult it is to obtain postcards, stamps, and possibly archival material from museums with a focus on the British Museum or the Humboldt Museum in Berlin? Is there a trend towards greater openness and access for a critical examination of colonial history compared to previous decades? I suppose that's for both Ida and... I think it's, it's it, postcard. Yeah, postcard. Yeah, sorry, more for you. Yeah. Sorry, sorry could you just repeat it? Just as the... Okay, sorry, I read too fast. Uh, how difficult it is to obtain postcard stamps and possibly archival material from museums with the focus on the British Museum or the Humboldt Museum in Berlin? Um, so is there a trend towards a critical examination of colonial history compared to previous decades? I mean, that's quite a big question. Yeah. Um, is, is, are they asking whether it's postcards that are being held by the British Museum and held by the Humboldt or of the British Museum or of the... Uh, uh, with the foot from, from the museum, from. 
on That's how it is. Maybe you can make a general comment on Yeah, just make a comment on it, possibly. There's a lot of discussion at the moment about, yeah. From, yes, from, yes, you said from. Artifacts in the British Museum, people yeah. thinking about what can yeah. we do with them, where do they belong, how to kind of, maybe you can make a general comment on, you know, with your experience, perhaps yeah, postcards with a broader question about, you know, yeah, to, uh, possession, belonging, you know, return, all of these kind of themes that I think people are discussing, particularly at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I mean... I mean, part, 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 one one point I'm not sure if it was put across necessarily in the in, in the presentation, but essentially what I've got is a what I've got is a digital archive beyond the physical material, and, and in a sense that's a kind of a sort of democratic kind of liberating um, act in a way, in in a sense, and and so for me what I'm trying to do is a kind of democratization of of the object okay, through the cool. digital archive in, in a sense. I mean, I can't really speak to sort of the restitution of postcards in the sense that there was, there's, yeah, <laughs> um, so but more. certainly the, the, you know, the images, the way that through this medium, as I think I, tr I tried to convey, um, you're able to preserve a photographic archive then of course is is, is incredibly important to preserve. Um, um, Popular culture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, chair. <laughs> are there other questions or comments from the from the room? I think we have we can another five minutes, right? Yeah, I, I know we're running late, but uh, we Great. just got, we just got a couple of minutes left. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the postcards, and uh, I really appreciate the really about uh, the postcard. They did a lot of things like the countryside, and well, I. Interesting thing is that postcard is a tiny stuff in our daily life, right? And there's a lot of stuff in our life, and postcard is a part. And I'm curious about how did you meet with the object and the fact which in which in English, which is like I suppose some somehow it will happen like uh, someone is interested in reading a lot of uh, daily objects that have reaching meaning and then so wanting to put postcards and study on it. Or it is just a uh, sudden meet with a uh, postcard by a graph it's something so interesting. I wanted, I'm curious about the story that I your answer is postcard. <laughs> um, I had to skip over it a bit, but essentially, I was I was writing this article and, and I was trying to find an image of the uh, the old English club in Stone Town, which is now Africa House uh, Hotel. And I just discovered that these postcards existed, and it just fascinated me almost just from yeah, a. Okay, uh, so it was just it was completely tangential to anything I was doing, and I just sort of and then I discovered this collection, and I just was curious to see it because. Um, you know, it was over a thousand images, or a thousand cards, rather. Um, and then when I found out that it was going to be sold, I just thought I need to preserve this because I'm a historian, and I just felt like it was, uh, it was, it was, it would be lost. Um, and then I, you know, reading the writings of the senders, uh, it's just, it just took me down just a whole tunnel, really. It had no end in the sense that I was just fascinated with the medium, with the images, with what they, the possibilities, um, some of which I sort of touched on, the kind of triangulation of, of the different uses of images, as well as I said, sort of through photograph to postcard to, you know, print media and magazines to stamps and That's notes and just being able to, um essentially construct what i really wanted to do actually it did, it did there was there was a, a shelved phd project which is not the phd project I ended up doing which was to kind of trace the evolution of images of zanzibar and postcards were going to be a big part of that as a source um but maybe something we can discuss in, in the coffee break or something but um yeah i mean i'm, I'm really i really want to, to 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 have this resource out there and people can just access it and use it in however, in however which way uh, i don't i don't make lay claim to it um so we have one more question and then we'll just finish the discussion so yes uh, uh, just a comment a comment deep comment let me forget zanzibar was an empire yes what is that yeah so yeah. yeah. and, and so what i want to say about the colonial context that in Zanzibar, it was much more possible because there was already established states, Sultanate states, which had 
created a conformist society. Apart from that, I don't think there was any discrimination going to mosques as going to churches. Mm. So Zanzibar was very, very different. That's why it's better at home. Well, thank you. Good. <laughs> So that was a great point to, to end on. So we thank yes. our panelists again for their fantastic presentations and the and the film as well, um, which we're joining online. Um, we will have a tea break now and start again at 12 o'clock promptly so we can start with the next panels, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome our panelists for the panel on languages and linguistics. Um, we have a very inter interesting paper coming up. Um, so uh, I'm not going to take too much time. I'm very pleased to welcome back uh, our team of linguists from SOAS. Very proud and very honored to be introducing you guys, all of you. It's a, a very interesting group of linguists, uh, some of them from SOAS, some of them uh, from Tanzania. Um, as well. Uh, and uh, so uh, the list of speakers actually is, uh, is quite broad. I, I would like to mention them all. So the team is made by Anna Gibson, um, Lutz Martin, who is not here today, uh, Frida Kanana, Teresa Poeta, who's here with us, Tom Jelpe, who's here with us, and then Anna Kariuki and Marceline Ocheng, who unfortunately are not able to be here with us, but uh, they're probably in the audience listening. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, um, the group to uh, presentation entitled Coastal versus Mainland Swahili, Perception and Variation, the case of Kilifi, Kenya. Welcome. Asante sana, uh, Angelica uh, Abarizenu. Good, I would like to start, uh, especially for those of you who weren't here uh, this morning, by re-congratulating Hannah <laughs> on her professorship. She is uh, the PI on our project and uh, we're very lucky to work with her. Um, so yeah, this is a little update on our ongoing project. We're about halfway through it now, entering the third of four years. And we're going to talk to you a bit about the context uh, of our project with some reflections on some data we collected in Kilifi, which is a town and county on the coast of Kenya uh, in March earlier this year. Um, so, um, as many of us are familiar with, there is a long tradition on research in Swahili variation and Swahili dialects, but particularly dialects found on the coast. So you can see from some of the references here, going back to the 1870s, there's been research on different dialects of Swahili, but predominantly on the coast. But the last few decades have seen a bit of a change as we're now looking more at the mainland varieties of Swahili, um, particularly in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and they are getting a bit more bit more focus in scholarship, as well as micro levels of variation within different Swahili dialects as well. However, for both academics and also everyday people, the distinction between coastal and mainland varieties of Swahili still seems relevant. Uh, and it still features a lot in studies on Swahili. You'll often hear about people saying this is a mainland variety, this is a coastal variety. Um, and this is often positioned uh, within the contrast between Uswahilini, the Swahili coast, which, of course, as Elsbeth mentioned earlier, is not such um, an easy to define thing, and the more multilingual mainland uh, on the other. Um, so in this talk, we want to look at the extent to which these categories of coastal and mainland are still relevant, um, gathering on that data, as I mentioned, from Kilifi. So um, after the introduction, we've got a bit of comparative context and then the focus on the data from Kilifi, as well as a summary. So um, as I've mentioned, um, and as Angelica mentioned, this is part of a larger project researching variation in Swahili dialects. And you can see on this map some of the different sites that we've looked at so far. So in Kenya, we've got Kisumu, Nairobi, and now Kilifi. And in Tanzania, we've got Moshi, Dar es Salaam, Iringa, and Mtwara. Um, and one of the really nice things about this project is we've used many different methods um, and many different researchers. We're a team of 10, so everyone brings something different to the team. And a lot of our research um, has been in person, but we did start um, in the first year of the project with an online survey, a perceptual dialect survey. Um, and in person, we've been doing sociolinguistic interviews, 
taking field notes, ethnographic notes, some uh, recordings of natural data, people just chatting, as well as more hardcore morphosyntactic <laughs> elicitation, uh, which we won't uh, bore you all too much with today. Um, and this is a nice picture of all 10 of us taken earlier this year in Dar es Salaam. So our current hypothesis, um, which sort of reflects what people have been saying in the scholarship, is that there are three different broad dialect areas of Swahili. Of course, it's not as simple as that, but this is the main pattern we're finding. So we've got a Kenyan mainland in the yellow, Tanzanian mainland uh, in the green, and then in the in the dark blue, we've got the coast. So there does still, still seem to be this coastal mainland split in our own findings, both on the grammatical level, but also in terms of people's attitudes and perceptions of variation in Swahili. And a fourth region can also probably be, be, be identified as the, the Western uh, varieties in DRC, Uganda, but they're beyond the scope of our current study. Um, and as I mentioned, this is supported by sociolinguistic and structural data. But of course, there is micro and macro variation going on within and beyond uh, these, these zones. So Kilifi itself is a coastal town uh, just north of Mombasa. Main activities are tourism and fishing. And the biggest communities are the Mijikenda. Then there are some uh, some some Swahili communities, the Bajuni. And of course, as with everywhere on the Indian Ocean, people from uh, South Asia, Arabs and Europeans. After Swahili, the main languages are from the Mijikenda uh, groups. We in particular found a lot of Giriyama and Choni speakers and also some Digo speakers who are from further, sp uh, further south. And the picture, as everywhere, is, is definitely complicated by the fact that it's received a lot of migration. So it's not as clear cut as just being a home for these communities. People have come from all over Kenya for economic opportunities, and they've, of course, brought their languages with them. And so the data that uh, Teresa will now present was collected uh, in April of this year in Kilifi around the town and also in a small village about 10 miles north of the town called Tezo. So I will now pass over to Teresa. Okay, so I will now talk through some of the data that we collected and some of the features. Uh, if you are not a linguist, don't be put off by the linguistic terminology. There's sort of lots of Swahili to look at, and we really want also your feedback of what you think about these forms, whether you have heard them, uh, how you perceive them as well. So this is a list of the different uh, features that uh, we'll now discuss. So we'll start sort of nice and simple with uh, some uh, noun class agreement. Uh, and what we have here are three examples of many that we have of what we found uh, sort of the pattern of Swahili in Kilifi um, being very similar from what we know from standard Swahili. And in a way, you might think sort of why are like, we presenting it or like where is the variation, but the sort of lack of variation in terms of the standard Swahili is itself interesting, especially in the context of other data that we have found throughout the project. So, uh, for example, in comparison with other locations in Kenya, our data from Nairobi or Kisumu, this is not the same that we found there. And uh, Anna and Mersin, who are part of the team, are research assistants based in Nairobi, who did this data collection with us. This was one of the first things that they found most striking, just the non-class pattern agreement. They sort of said straight away, this is so different from the way people speak, for example, in Nairobi, where they're based. Um, so in a sense, this supports this hypothesis of there being a coastal zone, um, of there being a construct, uh, contrast between coastal and mainland Kenya in, in this regard. So, Kitu Kizuri Haiki Jibure, Malazi Yanguni Masafi, Jicho Langu Linani Uma. Just, we had plenty of these, but these were just three to illustrate this point. Um, so, I'm now going to move on to another feature um, that we are discussing, and that's what we have sort of well, we have also been called in the literature the A tense, so a sort of present tense, a type of present tense, let's say, um, that again, it's not sort of completely unexpected or it's not that we had not come across it before, um, but it seems to be used mostly in coastal varieties, maybe even just more northern coastal varieties. Uh, and where we found it in other data somewhere else, it was mostly when it's used with the first person singular, so such as Nayenda. Uh, but in Kilifi, we really found people using 
very, very commonly the whole like paradigm of the stance. Um, so again, this would be in support of like keeping uh, in mind this hypothesis of the coastal zone. This again would support this split. Um, so we have a couple of examples. So you see, for example, in four, Quahibio, Wanda, Nyumbani, Wewe. So you see the second person singular, Wanda. In five, you see the third person singular, Huyu, Wanda, Chukwanini. Uh, so you might also see throughout the examples other interesting features of variation, and we can come back uh, to them maybe in the uh, question uh, and uh, answer slot. And I think we have another two. Yeah. So to show you again the like sort of whole paradigm. So in six, we now see the stance used for um, first person plural, tuaguna, and in fact in the next one as well, tuaguna na kwambia wakati wakina nyanya ilikuwa kwa wakati ni marambili tuaguna. So you see three different instances of the stance. And uh, last example here we see in the second person plural and singular. Uh, hapo ukitoka kule kazini ukijafika unachukua maji ukaoge mwala sima walala. Uh, so, sorry, I haven't been reading the translations. When you leave work and you have arrived home, you take some water to shower, eat some porridge and sleep. So you can see in bold, again, we have uh, shown you two more instances of uh, this tense. So you can see really uh, beyond just the first person singular, which is perhaps the form that you might have also encountered more uh, commonly. Okay, I'm gonna uh, move now to another feature. And this is one that uh, if you've maybe attended Baraza last year and two years before and heard us talking about our project, you might remember uh, this feature that we mentioned and it's one we've given sort of quite a lot of attention because we know that there's some variation in Swahili already from previous sources. And this is how to mark habitual. So uh, in standard Swahili, if you're learning Swahili like I did here at SOAS, uh, you remember that who is used to mark something that you do habitually, like huoga, huenda, hufanya. Uh, but we also know from previous research that there's a suffix ag or aga, which is quite commonly used in colloquial Swahili to mark habitual. So this is an example, not from our data, but from Ruge Malira. Una, gula, una kulaga wapi, where do you usually eat? And as Ruge Malira says, standard Swahili might be reclaiming productive inflection ag, and its white occurrence in colloquial Swahili seems to be unstoppable. So this is 2010. You can tell us also what, how, how you think this is going. Uh, but so starting off with this, we have looked into this in our different location. And before telling you about Swahili, here is a little just sort of schematic overview of what we have found so far. So we have indeed found quite a lot of variation in these forms, uh, but also in functions, we don't really have time to go through it uh, today, but also co-occurrence of some of these forms. Um, maybe I can come back to this. But if you look at the map, you have the seven locations where we have collected data so far. And you can see that this quite nicely map onto this on three um, dialect zone that we are proposing. So we have the who, the more sort of standard Swahili coastal appearing on the coast. Um, you will see that there is also ab on the coast, but this corresponds to Dar es Salaam. So we know Dar es Salaam is an urban center with lots of speakers of different languages. So perhaps slightly different than the rest of the coast. And then we have the aga, but in fact we have ag and ang, and we see the split across Kenya and Tanzania. So you really see the three zones here. Ang, mainland Kenya, Ag, mainland Tanzania, and Hu on the coast. As I said, this is a bit schematic. And in fact, we found also sometimes co-occurrence of both. So you see in the bullet points there, um, sometimes we find Hu and Ag together, like Hu Somanga, or Hu also used with the verb to be, Huwa Nasoma, or even Huwa Nasomanga, so different combinations. And now in Kilifi, so as we said, we found mostly the who form, um, but that's sort of maybe simplifying it a little bit. There was indeed more variation and a more complex picture. But in nine, we have the who form, kila asubuhi mi huoga, I bath every morning. But then we also found lots of um, uses of the phrase sana sana, and we'll come back to this reduplication uh, use as well. 
either on its own or in combination with who or hua. So in 10, we have watoto wangu hua na waungelesha sana sana kiswahili na kizungu. This is from our social linguistic interviews when we're asking people about languages they use. So my children, usually I speak to them in Swahili and in English. So you see both the hua and the sana sana. Sometimes we had the sana sana also just with the present tense. Um, now coming back to the ag or ang, even though it predominantly was not used in Swahili, we did come across it. Uh, but when we came across it and we asked speaker about it, there was really this perception of, oh, this is bara Swahili, a very sort of distancing from this is how people speak sort of on the mainland, not on the coast, um, but not always negative. We found we have uh, some um, quotes from interviews that also for young people, it was in, in fact considered sort of like cool or a certain style linked to uh, some aspects of their identity. Um, and also, as we said, as Tom mentioned in the introduction, you know, migration, urbanization, there are people bringing different languages, linguistic repertoires to Kilifi. So we found also these youths in the in 12th of Ang or Ing uh, by some speakers. For example, this we happen to know that this is a person who moved to Kilifi and uh, most of their life spoke Swahili and Maasai. So perhaps to do with that, uh, but still we wanted to put a use that we sort of captured. Siendingi huko, I don't usually go there. And I think we have a quote on this next one about this sort of youth and using ag or ang for identity. So this is uh, one of us asking a participant about, have you heard this ga, anga, like hu or ganga? And the participant says, hapana, hiyo sasa ni ya Nairobi. Huku kiswahili imekuwa kama lugha ya mama, kwa hivyo watoto wanatamani kujifunza lugha ingine kama sheng ndio aonekane amepevuka. So no, this is used in Nairobi. So again, this sort of split straight away. But in explaining here, Kiswahili is, you know, people's mother tongue. And so young people or children learn to desire other things like Sheng to sort of show uh, that they're modernized. And another participant says something similar about young people using Ag or Ang to show that they have lived in a big city, to show sort of I've been to Nairobi, I've come back and sort of almost showing off this part of their identity if sort of we can interpret that way. So also cultural connections, marker of urban identity. And as we said, also to do with uh, different speakers of different languages, bringing new elements. Okay, so I think I have a couple of features left. Um, so one, again, we mentioned in the previous years, we look a lot at diminutives because we know that there is some variation in how Swahili speakers refer to small things. From standard coastal varieties, we know that class 7, 8 is often used to um, express a diminutive, like kitoto, small child, bikazi byangu, my small tasks. But we also know that in colloquial Swahili, these classes 12, 13 are commonly used, um, which are common in many Bantu languages, and that both forms uh, can be used uh, in, in many Swahili varieties. So 14 has an example of this Class 12, 13, Casimo, small phone, Tundege, Twingi, many small birds. This is data from other places in our project. But this very much corresponds to what we found in Kilifi. So different forms to express diminutives, including this class 12. So there's quite a high degree in variation. So the picture is not so straightforward as a split coast, mainland, or even a split Kenya, Tanzania. Uh, we have in 15, uh, class seven, Kijiti Kidogo, although you can see even the Kijiti, sometimes they use sort of, of class five, which is augmentative, then class seven uh, diminutive. But also some speakers said, oh, you just say Mkim Dogo, <laughs> just a small tree, as simple as that. But then the ska, we really found that this is again from uh, from interviews that we conducted with people. Hata katoto kadogo, kakianza, kananza na kiswahili. Even a small child usually begins by learning Swahili. You can see the 12th agreement really throughout. Uh, and this is also another quote. I'm not sure what exactly we were discussing, but uh, this person who's sharing some of their personal history. Nilipelekwa na kamrembo, akanyonjesha. He was talking about avocados. We did put that to clarify. But you can also see that here the ka was added to the noun class prefix, while in other cases it was replaced with the noun class prefix. 
Okay, uh, locative marking. Uh, again, there's variation in Swahili. You can say nanda shamba, just the noun, nanda shambani, you use the ni, or you can use a preposition. We know there's variation in that. In uh, the Kilifi, we found uh, that people mostly use the ni, locative. And although, again, this might seem sort of expected, it contrasts with what we know from our other data that in Kenya, there's a lot of using of kwa, like kwa shule, kwa shamba, rather than the ni. Um, but again, the picture is more complex. It wasn't just straightforward as ni, like in 18, watoto wako shuleni. We did also found kwa, so niko kwa gari, I'm in the car. Kwa in standard Swahili is said to be used only for human nouns rather than objects. Uh, but also the use of just niko shule rather than niko shuleni. So this perhaps there's uh, more going on about the specific phrases, but it does show that there is variation going on. Okay, and very quickly, just last two sort of notes, just to also show that uh, we looked through our data and we found other sort of things that are often used in Kilifi, but maybe are just not necessarily um, sort of something specific just to Kilifi and might be wider cross Swahili or cross linguistic um, features. So one is using this reduplication for emphasis. So when we looked at sana sana, to say that I do something habitually, speakers use this reduplication a lot in our data. So in 21, they consider Kiswahili to be difficult because they do not focus on it. So they don't get into it properly. Hawaji in Gizi, kwa Kiswahili, wazima wazima, wakasoma kabisa. And you can see other examples. I'm just going to skip so I can finish on time. And very last, I think you might recognize this. Again, we think this is much more sort of widespread in Swahili and across languages. We had lots of examples of speakers using this like discourse strategy of leaving a word or phrase unfinished and then finishing it up as a way of sort of engagement. So I don't know if I'll quite get the intonation right, but sort of wanaongea kidogo ili wengine wamalizi wamalizie. Tukulange huwa inamanaisha chakula iko tuku tukulange. So this sort of, and we had a lot of this, we recognize it uh, among ourselves, we've discussed it from other um, varieties as well. Okay, and just to summarize, so uh, in terms of the features that we have discussed, so we had three features with sort of support, if you think back of Tom's introduction, they support this sort of split, uh, three-way split, but really we are looking at the coastal mainland here. And that's noun class agreement. So having this sort of pattern with standard Swahili noun class agreement on the coast, the use of this atens, and also the habitual marking. So the use of who rather than ag or anga. But then we also saw two features where the picture was a bit more complex, diminutive marking and locative marking. So we found forms, variation that was there, but we also found in other location. So both internal variation, but also maybe uh, a picture that's shifting. So maybe some features which are coming in with the shifting dynamics in Kilifi overall. And then some other data which shows um, things which are noted in our Kilifi data, but really are wider in Swahili, even cross-linguistically, like reduplication, and also just now this discourse strategy of uh, unfinished utterances. Um, so just to sum summarize completely, uh, the data that we have collected and look at uh, does provide some evidence for this coastal mainland distinction, uh, supported both by our morphosyntactic data, but also from inter social linguistic interviews and what people perceive and tell us about. But the data also shows that there is more internal and localized variation. And Kilifi, in this sense, represent both sort of this traditional Swahili coast um, but also the sustained history of language contact. So also, um, as Tom said, other languages being there historically for a long time. And then we discussed things like migration, urbanization, uh, speakers bringing new linguistic repertoires into the picture, which is shifting slightly the linguistic dynamics. So as we say here, in many ways, Kilifi represent sort of this reality of some of the coastal areas where uh, they're both urban centers in this region, 
but has all have also these traditional features um, associated traditionally with the Swahili coast. Uh, and this really reflects this sort of ongoing, dynamic, change, ever-changing sort of a linguistic situation uh, of repertoires of the speakers in these communities. And I think that's it. So sorry for running. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, okay. Thank you so much for this. Uh, and um, let me just, Nico. Okay, Nico, you can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I just have to. Sorry, sorry. One second here. And uh, yeah, are you sharing from your end or shall I, I share? Uh, I think this should work. Uh, no, I think it's best if I share it. It's up to you. Uh, I tried now. This okay, this is fine. what it would look like if I share. <clears throat> yeah, that's fine. It's fine. Should we do it that way? Why is it not? Hold on. Um, it's not letting me move it. So perhaps if you unshare for a minute. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. I, I can move it, but I can also un stop sharing. Okay. Um, yeah, I just. I okay. Know. I stopped oh. sharing. Okay. All right. Can you share again now? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No I'm not a big tech. No problem. Yeah. We can see it. Perfect. perfect. Yeah, perfect. and I can also share. I can also click through. Okay, perfect. So, welcome, Nico. Uh, and is uh, obviously is online. Uh, maybe we can see him a little bit on the side now. But anyway, he's with us. And uh, welcome, Nico. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Ah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thanks to the organizers, uh, Angelica and um, Ida and everyone else at, at, at SOAS and um, also for allowing me to present online. Unfortunately, I can't be with you today. Hopefully next year I will be back there in person. Um, I'm very happy to contribute to this exciting conference and exciting panel. And I will talk about um, Union Kinguana. As you see, I slightly changed my title, made it a bit shorter. The standardization of um, the Swahili language in the Congo, a neglected research topic, one could say, compared to the, the, the field of documentation of the standardization of standard Swahili as we know it from the East African coast. And especially I look at it in the context of missionary activities and Bible trans translations, um, <clears throat> especially around Yakusu station, a Baptist station uh, in the Congo. Um, this is what I will talk about. So um, I have uh, two key questions here. What did the non-standardized contact Swahili from Yakuso in 1905 look like? So before the missionaries started their standardization on it, which occurred in the, the second half of the 20th century, uh, first half of the 20th century. And then how did missionaries standardize this Union Guana or Union King Guana between especially 1928 and 1960? And this is ongoing research. Uh, I'm still to dig deeper in some archival sources, especially also in the UK. But this is practically uh, as far as I've gotten now in the short time um, that I have. <clears throat> okay. um, so very little has been said uh, on the um, standardization of Kinguana or Kinguanya, as I call it here, because the earliest sources that I look at that mention actually Congolese Swahili uh, as a distinct variety uh, call it Kinguanya and not yet Kinguana, the label that others have written about and myself too, and that you may be uh, acquainted and, and aware with and aware of. Um, so these are glottonyms with different connotations, more positive, more negative, for example. Um, also Congo Swahili is another one we have just heard in, in a very, very nice presentation of Western Swahili as the dialects at the Western periphery, for example. And um, uh, this, these standardization uh, efforts took place in the first half of the 20th century, um, roughly beginning more than 50 years after um, 
Swahili had already reached the Congo. I will not go into detail here. Um, so missionaries' interventions in the Swahili-speaking areas of the Belgian Congo were taking place in different parts uh, at different times and are generally uh, understudied. Um, there is work by Michael Mewis, which is very valuable here because he has a very vast knowledge on missionaries in the Congo, and he has also helped me um, to, to rectify some things that, for example, erroneously have been published by uh, Fabian in his otherwise very wonderful book from 1986, <clears throat> where he provides a valuable account of the uh, history of Swahili in Katanga or Shaba, Lubumbashi. Um, yet he, he said that the term Kingwana or Kingwanya, um, uh, the first one must have been uh, actually in Stapleton's work. And he says the Congo language handbook from 1903, but it's actually um, uh, a, an edition, a, late, a later or further edition of his suggestions uh, for a grammar of Bangala. And this is the mistake that Michel helped me to find actually in this work. And this changes somehow uh, the narrative because then these two sources that I found and will share with you now are the first two sources where Kingwanya or Kingwana are actually mentioned in 1905, also two sources written by Stapleton. So uh, no extensive overall study of Swahili in the Congo and the history of Swahili in the Congo has been provided. I have an overview chapter of a forthcoming manuscript that I'll gladly share with you if you're interested. Interested. It's it's a brief overview of around 50, 60 pages. And I'm also working on the history of Swahili around Lake Kivu. Uh, this talk is more on the Baptist Missionary Society, BMS, and their work on and with Swahili at Yakusu Station on the Upper Congo River near present-day Kisangani, former Stanleyville or Stanley Falls. Um, so there are historical notes uh, on the arrival of the so-called in the literature Arab Zanzibaris um, in Kisangani can be found in different uh, sources. Also, for example, the autobiography of, of uh, Tipo Tip in his Maisha and uh, also others. Um, so I do not only look at standardization alone, but also on the missionaries' perception of Swahili and what they uh, um, what contrastive and uh, um, opposing policies they pursued here. Um, to understand where Yakusu is, you can see it up in the uh, in, on this map right next to uh, um, Stanleyville Kisangani. Um, so this is Yakusu Station. So this is uh, approximately the area where Swahili had reached around 1877 with um, Stanley and uh, Tipu Tip. And we can see, if we look at the data later on, that between 1877 and 1905, um, we find already that restructuring and language change had taken place. This is very interesting. And I was not aware of that before I found these two sources because we don't have other written material in the local Swahili or uh, um, the, 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 the non-coastal Swahili from this area because usually the written sources are among Zanzibaris and uh, with other Swahili speakers who spoke a more coastal Swahili in this area. You see the Congo River here or Lualaba River and uh, to have a very brief history, as we can found, find in Hunt, for example, George Granville and other missionaries of the London-based Baptist Missionary Society founded Yakusu on the Upper Congo River in the Leopoldian land they knew as Congo land in 1896. The free state period in the Upper Congo region was marked by struggle and war among the new colonial military forces and Zanzibari overlords who initially entered the region in search of ivory and slaves about the time of Henry Morton Stanley's epic journey downriver in 1870. The Zanzibari period resides in local uh, social memory as the first of two colonialisms here. So the Belgian colonialism following after, after they had chased the um, what they called in the Arab campaign, the uh, Arab Zanzibaris in 1894. In 1929, uh, the the medical mission uh, with a training school for midwives, which was very famous all over the colony or the later colony, um, uh, actually um, was founded and built. You see a, a picture down here of Yakusu and the historical events between 1896 and the early 1910s are summarized in Smith uh, 1911 uh, on uh, Yakusu, uh, Heart of Africa. That's the title, I think. Um, 
So it's interesting to see how in these uh, writings of missionaries, missionaries developed an interest in the local Swahili, which was already spread and used there when they arrived and f founded the station. And then they lost that interest also again, because they were not interested in Swahili or Kingwana or Kingwanya. They wanted to work on the local languages, of course, for the gospel or for the Bible. So this was Lokele, especially in the focus of the Baptists here. Uh, so I quote from Smith, uh, a Baptist missionary, and he says, recently many huts have sprung up with a few hundred yards of the BMS station on the same bank, and the people are showing greater interest to be am amiable. Uh, though we cannot talk to them in Lokele, there's a number of young uh, people who round us uh, uh, who know sufficient Kingwana, localized Swahili, to be able to conduct evangelistic services amongst them. It is necessary that one of the Yakuza missionaries should know Kingwana fluently for the sake of the Bakumu work another ethnic group here, and that around the falls. In 1906, I had obtained a speaking acquaintance with it and began to feel my feet in addressing them, but the subsequent pressing claims of the Lokele work first forced the abandonment of that effort. And then again, he says, Kingwana is at best a mongrel language and presents unexpected difficulties and disappointing poverty, not poverty, poverty, of expression when it is used as an instrument for translation. Lokele, on the contrary, is full of surprises. The Swahili, covering a wider range of ideas and having incorporated many Arabic words, often comes to our help. What does that show us? Kingwana and Swahili were here uh, uh, perceived as two different languages. When he speaks of Swahili, he speaks of coastal Swahili. Um, which has Arabic words in it. The other thing, the local Swahili is Kingwana is not seen as a language as such, but they needed it to work on other languages. So I came aware, became, became aware of two rare Swahili texts, Mashaila Nakazia Yesu and Kita, Kitabu Chakulisha, both presumably written by Stapleton and documenting the language used in Yakusu at this station at the time in 1905. There are inconsistencies, interference from Lokele language, there are wrong forms, there are even words. I do not know what they mean or what they could mean. Very interesting, actually, if we think of it has, it is a descriptive account of the Swahili used in 1905 in that time without any standardization, without any codification or improvement of the language. And that we want to contrast with the Union Kingwana. So these must be the two earliest written sources in Congo Swahili, I think, in Kingwanya. Um, and it's, of course, a doculect that shows early contact features, uh, which are still found in present-day Swahili from Kisangani. If we look at present-day Kisangani Swahili, we find a lot of what we find in here. And I want to give you an example. Just have to see how I... Yeah, now I should... Uh, uh, yeah. I th hope you can see it. Uh, so we find, for example, invariable quantifiers, batumingi, many people, the negation hapana occurs, which is a pigeonized or a restructured feature we find very often, and still occurs sometimes in the Swahili from Kisangani. The agreement of the copula mutu iku, for example, um, uh, occurs here, uh, freestanding objects. So objects are not prefixed. We don't have prefixes, but we have, for example, bakaleta yeye, they, they then brought him. Um, so freestanding objects, we find the, the use of the, the occurrence of the distal demonstrative much more than uh, the, the near demonstrative, for example, if you look at the right side, yeso kuitikia ile, and so on, we find, for example, adjective agreement, which is already petrified or simplified as occurring today in, in present-day Congolese Swahili, maneno mubaya, so mu is no longer seen or understood as uh, an adjective prefix of class one or three, but used for all other classes too. These are just a few features which we still find today, and that makes these two sources extremely interesting. <clears throat> so missionaries after that uh, started their interventions and created a standard variety. Um, so it was, uh, it, there were some missionaries in Yakusu, and there were also some other missionaries further up in the, in, further up north in the Ituri forest. And these were, for example, Stud and uh, Lauda and others who translated the Bible in, into the local varieties of Swahili. So now the interesting thing here was that over time, with the first translations and the tentative translations that missionaries did, two different varieties appeared to missionary varieties of Swahili in the Congo. And these two were Ituri Kingwana and Lualaba Kingwana. These two were practically unified uh, and yet separate 
um, missionary Congo Swahili varieties. And they wanted to bring these two together to create one Congo Swahili used for the Bible and they thought also for daily interactions of people, for example. So, uh, but this took some time and especially was based on um, on two conferences that took place, the first one in Yakusu uh, in 1934 and the second one in Ituri in 1946. Um, and the Bible finally was uh, uh, published and the translation of the Union Bible occurred in 1960. So I will just briefly sketch the history. The first point to mention is the early standardization tentatives and attempts at Waika Station, uh, further up river, so around in Maniema, uh, around today's Kindu. And this is uh, the, the, the couple Whitehead was working on that in the 20s already. And Whitehead uh, says, John Whitehead says, for example, I quote him, I found I was among a tribe which calls itself Bangengele, but although they have their own language, they readily understood the kind of Swahili called hereabouts Kingwanya. This will be the language to which we must give our attention at any rate at first. That was 1912. Then the couple also mentions in there, Manuel de Kinguana, Le Dialect Occidental de Swahili, which is already a prescriptive account of Swahili here. This is not a descriptive account how people spoke. This has a lot of features from coastal Swahili uh, uh, as they wanted to implement it in their mission in Waika Station. And they said, um, so they pr uh, proposed to discover the agreement and the differences of the mother Swahili with her daughter Kinguana and to put into in, into agreement or uh, um, um, what they found in relation uh, with the, the 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 known laws of Bantu languages, transforming the unple unpleasant uh, foreign elements. Uh, so th this is very interesting. This perception, how uh, kind of the mother Swahili and the daughter Kingwana were pictured. Michel Mewes has worked on Waika Station and also on Whitehead's work. And he says, uh, I will not read the whole quote, but just point to these uh, um, red parts. He could not resist the temptation to gentrify the language. That means to design an enhanced remodeling of it, which was to become the unified standard for use in the entire Eastern Congo. That is Whitehead's work. And then also he worked on this gentrification of Kingwana together with his wife Lillian, the fruit of their work seeing the light in the work that I've just shown you, Manuel de Kingwana. But then interesting, missionaries in the eastern regions of the Congo found the Whitehead spouse's work on Kingwana not implementable. That was not the final work of unification of Congo Swahili. But um, as I said, there were these two missionary var varieties in the Congo. So we have Lualaba Kingwana uh, along the Congo River and Itu. Sorry, Nico, two minutes. Two minutes, all right. And Ituri Kingwana um, further up north. Uh, and these two were brought together now in two events. And these two events is one conference and Yakusu in 1934, which was in initiated by the Bible Society Secretary for Equatorial Africa. Um, and then uh, this was a, a meeting um, at Yakusu where missionaries from many different missionary societies came together. You can see them here listed. And I gladly share the slides with you too. Uh, and all these came together and then discussed somehow how um, the language should look like. And after that, uh, what they what, what they did during this meeting, they translated all of Matthew, the Evangel of Matthew, in these few days of a conference, and that was the tentative version of it. And the second conference took place in Ituri, uh, and that was the final unification conference in Yankunde, led by missionary William Deans, and they, for example, looked at orthography, lexicon, old forms, innovations, and reintroductions too. And they also looked, for example, at the Aga form, the Ag or Ak, which was also widely distributed by the time already at uh, in the Congo. This was the second conference. And after these two conferences, Union Guana saw the light of day. So this, the first one is standard Swahili, as we know it. And the second one is Union Guana. And you see, for example, in this example here that we have already as a, a deviating feature, noun class one, Mutu, Agreement, Mwanawake wa peke, Uzima wa milele, that was standardized in a way. And the relativizer all throughout Union Guana is the O, the O of reference, Alivio Penda. Another very brief example here, um, we find features that are standard-like, locative ni or katika, the relative o, and so on. So uh, um, these are interesting examples of union 
uh, King Guana, but not all, and this is the last point I'm making here, uh, there were divergent and competing Bible translations into Union Guana. There was a high version, that was the Bible, and there was the Habarinjema, that was the low version. And these two deviated in terms of relativizers, habitual aspect, demonstratives, and locatives. And that was interesting. Missionaries fought about these different realizations of a Union Guana. So some used the, the low ones, it used the Enye Enye relativizer, the habitual ak instead of who. So this corresponds very well to the, the, the talk before. A threefold versus twofold demonstrative system and locative already with the locative copula uh, um, co had already become an existential copula. Nico Moalimo would be, I am a teacher and not only uh, the locative sense of it. So this is uh, uh, to finish up here. So the missionaries work on Union Kinguana from the 1920s to 60s must be studied in more detail. I have to look into some archives here too. I will do that very soon. The role of different missionary groups, the Père Blanc, White Fathers, for example, is understudied, or the Marist Brothers. So the link between standardization of Congo Swahili and East Coast Swahili in the 1930s, that's what I would also want to look at, and that's important to look at, was there a mutual influence. And the language ideologi ideological work too. How is this union, union version today perceived by the public, by churchgoers? It's still used in the church. Actually, it's, it's actively used. And by Bible translators today, too. And then if we look at some radio and TV from the Congo, we notice kind of a standard Swahili, which is not really standard. I assume this is actually this Union Guana, but no one has ever looked at it because it's always said it's kind of coastal or standard and so on. And this is what I want to look at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so now we have our third speaker, Adam. Our own uh, Adam from SOAS. Adam is a Swahili lecturer at SOAS currently. And Juma online, hopefully. And Juma online as well, of course. Jum uh, Juma, you po? <laughs> <laughs> so hold on, I'm a little bit lost again here. Uh, okay, so this, I need to, yeah. So Ju... Uh, it's hopefully... Nash. Juma, Upo. Participant, let me check. Um, Hello. Yeah. Juma. Juma. Adam. Hey, Karibu. Tunaanza sasa. How do I get this out here? Finally. Okay. Adam, there you are. Okay. So, Tristan. Ah, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Everybody's I'm China. So today we're going to present our topic, which is teaching Swahili, key Swahili using the communicative method, two case studies from the UK and Zanzibar. So I'm Adam and I teach Swahili at SAS, Pamojan at Dr. Ida, and then also Juma. Um, Juma, labda unataka kujita mulisha? Juma. A student of Swahili for foreigners in the State University of Zanzibar, also a teacher of English in Swahili in Tanzania and secondary school. Thank you. So, can you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to go. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, this is this is our topic, and I know I'm aware that there's a lot of experience in the room. Um, I studied Swahili at SOAS, and we have some students here as well, so you'll recognize some of the some of what we're going to look at today. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's not so much like a formal research, it's more kind of some ideas that we use based on our own experience in the UK and Zanzibar. Um, and yeah, it's good, like, hopefully you can get more conversation. They used to, there was a, once a round table on teaching Swahili at the as part, as part of the Baraza. So I think that would be something that we could maybe like, yeah, bring back. Mm. So just to outline, so we're going to present what the communicative method in language pedagogy is. And then some of the key areas. So, for example, accuracy versus fluency, um, or kwaki swahili usahihi didia utididikaji, na deductive versus inductive teaching, and then our case studies, and then the conclusion, um, which is uh, context is key, or kwaki swahili muktata ni muhimu. And yeah, just to say as well, as as swahili is obviously taught in a lot of places here in Europe also in America and obviously in East Africa. 
so yeah, obviously the issues around Swahili pedagogy, several textbooks. So yeah, it's a big it's a big topic as well. Um, so what is the communicative method? So the communicative approach is adopted from English language teaching, um, and it prioritizes learning through genuine communication, focusing on contextual language use. So this is based on the idea that learning language successfully comes through having to communicate real meaning. And when learners, when learners are involved in real communication, their natural strategies for language acquisition will be used. And this, this will allow them to learn to use the language. So this might look like often in textbooks, for example, we have language in context at the market, um, in the classroom, these kind of contexts. So it's a very common like language teaching strategy. And then, so we're just basically today talking about what that means for Swahili. Um, and then what this looks like in reality as well is the class is taking place in the target language. So in our case, in Kiswahili, um, with the opportunity to reinforce grammar rules in English. So, um, so now Juma is going to talk about this Usahihi video, Utiridikaji, which is a key. Yeah. So Juma. Santa Sana, uh, it is very uh, uh, great to me to get this opportunity to participate in, in Swahil Baraza. Uh, briefly, Usahihi na Utiridikaji. Uh, Itaanza kwa kuzungumzia kwa kufupi swala la usahihi kwamba ni utumiaji wa lugha kwa kuzingatia kanuni za lugha kwa kuepuka kufanya makosa na makosa yanakuwepo makosa makubwa kuna makosa madogo madogo errors in text ah uh, kwa mfano kuna makosa ya matamshi eh, kuna makosa ya sarufi kuna makosa ya Uteuzi wa msamiati chukuli mfano kama kosa uh, mwanafunzi anapotumia neno uh, amka amka wakati mwingine anaweza akalitumia kama amkwa umeamkwa na nani akimaanisha umeamshwa na nani kwa sababu ya e, masuala ya kauli za vitenzi anaweza akajikuta anatumia neno amka sivyo tarajiwa kwa kutia, kwa kuchagua msamiati ambao sio sahihi. Lakini wajifunzaji wengi wa lugha hupendelea kujifunza e, lugha kwa kuzingatia usahihi zaidi kwa sababu usahihi wanadhani ndio unaowapa fursa ya kujiamini. Wanapojua lugha kwa usahihi ndio wanahisi kwamba watajiamini zaidi. Ha, lakini si wataalamu wengi kwa sasa hupendelea ujifunzaji wa sarufi ya lugha moja kwa moja kama vile kupitia tafsiri na badala yake kupendekeza kutumia mbinu ya mbinu ya mawasiliano katika kujifunza kuzungumza na kujifunza sarufi kwa wakati mmoja uh, katika mtazamo wa kimawasiliano wa ujifunzaji lugha kanuni uh, au usahihi kwa ujumla kuzingatiwa kwa kiwango kidogo sana kwa hiyo tunapozungumzia language actress kwenye mtazamo wa kimawasiliano kwenye mkabala wa kimawasiliano kwa usahihi haupewi kipaumbele sana usiririkaji kwa pande mwingine usiririkaji fluid huu ni utumiaji wa lugha kwa mwendo wa wastani wa mazungumzo pasina kusitafuta kusipo tarajiwa Utaratibu huu huwa na makosa katika utumiaji lugha lakini makosa hayo hayaharibu maana lengwa. Kwa hiyo kwenye utaratibu wa flow uh, makosa ambayo hayaharibu maana huwa yanavumiliwa sana. Kwa mfano mzunguma na kundi anaweza akajaribu kusema uh, hivi sasa sikuli wali akimaanisha hivi sasa sili wali. Sasa kosa kama hili kwenye masuala ya flow kwa linavumilika sana. Na linamfanya mwanafunzi aendelee kuamini kwamba anaweza kutumia lugha vizuri. Taratibu huu huwa na makosa katika utumiaji lugha, lakini makosa hayo hayaharibu hayaharibu maana lengwa. Kinachozingatiwa zaidi ni kuasiliana na kuelewana na sio kukosoana. Kwa mfano mwingine, nitoe mfano mwingine hapa kwa sentensi hii kijana changu kimeenda 
shule leo sentensi hii inaeleweka kwamba mwanafunzi au uh, mtumiaji lugha aliposodia kwamba my boy has gone to school today lakini tunaona kwamba kuna makosa baadhi pia mfano mwingine mwanafunzi anaweza akasema viti kimoja kilichodondoka kimevunjika so pia tunaweza tukaelewa maana hapa ingawaje sentensi ina makosa kwa hiyo kwa upande wa utilizaji ni makosa kama haya huwa yanavumiliwa. Sentensi hizi katika usahihi zitakosolewa sana. Lakini utilizaji hazina shida kwa sababu maana imeeleweka. Asante sana. So kwa ufupi um yeah fluency is about speaking and communicating without worrying too much about getting the correct grammar. So we have examples here of um some mistakes but yeah uh, it's about just speaking and but obviously like speaking grammar um knowing the grammar and like getting being accurate of grammar is very important for example at soas um we have exams and the students need to know the grammar as well so obviously some students want to speak maybe they make mistakes in grammar um but we we obviously put a lot of emphasis on grammar so although the communicative method is about speaking skills obviously we need to know the grammar as well so this is why we're talking about the communicative method to how to teach grammar through the communicative method Um, so a key distinction here is deductive versus inductive teaching. So a deductive approach to teaching language starts by giving learners the rules, then examples, then practice. So this is compared with an inductive approach, which starts with the examples and asks learners to find the rules themselves. So the idea is that the deductive approach is a quite teacher-centered approach, and it's maybe more traditional, um, like the teacher at the front of the classroom explaining the language to students versus the inductive approach, which is more learner-centered. Um so let's see some examples now so yeah we have the noun class system for example um which we've seen a lot uh, with the other presentations and yeah this is obviously a big area in Swahili and one that um students often struggle with because it's not familiar as yeah so just for our people who don't know Swahili nouns are grouped into noun classes based on their prefix um with each noun having a prescribed number So this is a complex grammatical system unfamiliar to many English language speakers and most learners in a UK context. Um yeah so how this looks is uh they have an agreement system which affects the use of other words in a sentence. So mtu mrefu huyu anatoka Kenya. And this tall person comes from Kenya and then kisu kirefu hiki kinatoka Kenya. This tall knife comes from Kenya. So yeah it's, it's it's something that students can struggle with because it's it affects every element in the sentence and it's a very important part of learning Swahili. So we're going to see some ways of teaching this. So yeah, this uh, teaching noun classes. So this is for example is a noun class table which I remember being shown at SOAS in my third or fourth week and it can be quite overwhelming for some people obviously it's a lot of information all the noun classes. So this is an example of a deductive kind of way of teaching language so it's showing the students how the system, like all the rules and then yeah um so that's kind of a deductive way of teaching noun classes so versus an inductive way would be like so sasa hapa nini unaona nini niambie tu tell us what do you see now in the in this room kwaki swahili viti ndio viti kitu kingine watu ndio so for example this is like a listing noun classes using things in the context so yeah vt in the classroom so yeah this is an example of doing that so we have vt madirisha hapa hamna um but what to people so these are our noun classes or different nouns that belong in different classes and then the adjective kubwa big so this is yeah so here we have how the agreement works for the adjectives so vt vikubwa madirisha makubwa watu Wakubwa. So it's like the students can, yeah, it's an easy way of showing how the noun adjectives work with the noun classes. So it takes, it can be a bit like confusing because it's like, why is the why is the adjective different? And yeah, you just kind of have to take it as it comes, I guess. But then, then you can reinforce the rules in English. So does the adjective change? Yes. What changes the prefix? The bit at the beginning. What did we add? The same as the noun class prefix in this case. Viti vikubwa. So it's like alliteration. So another way of teaching noun classes communicatively, or like, yeah, would be having like a mind map. So this, I'm not sure, I won't bother going on it, but it's basically like a 
Padlet. I'm not sure. Maybe some people know. It. Maybe I'll press it, but it's kind of a place where. Let's see if I can drag this across. Yeah. So the students can themselves. They're encouraged to go on and just input things they know about Swahili based on the noun classes. So they've been asked to kind of talk about the different noun classes, and yeah, some of the examples in context of like adjectives, um, and how it works. And then here we have an example of how students can together kind of work out some of the nuances of the, the language. So someone, so Claire's written jicho, macho for I, eyes. And then another student's added, some nouns in this class will appear without the G in the singular form, e.g. tunda, matunda. So kind of the nuances of this noun class. And they're thinking about themselves rather than just saying, oh, there's these different nouns and I've come in the end. Sometimes it keeps the G in the plural as in Gina, Magina. So there's just like nuances within this noun class. The students are encouraged to like talk about it themselves. And um, yeah. And so Sasa, Juma, Ata Eleza. Um, yeah, how it is in Zanzibar teaching noun classes. Santi. Asante sana. Kwa ujumla, hapa Zanzibar kuna mitazamo, bado kuna mitazamo mbali mbali, kusiana na kufundishaji wa sarufi kwa ujumla uh, baadhi ya wa, ya walimu na wanafunzi wa lugha ya pili ambayo uh, ni hasa hasa ni Kiswahili bado ana msimamo wa kutoa kipaumbele juu ya kuijadili sarufi zaidi nisoma sarufi kwa kina kwa hiyo bado kuna changamoto ya kuelewa tofauti kati ya ufundishaji wa Kiswahili kama lugha ya kwanza na ufundishaji wa Kiswahili kama lugha ya pili. Eh, eh siku wengine tunaamini kwamba ufundishaji wa Kiswahili kama lugha ya kwanza au ufundishaji wa Kiingereza kama lugha ya kwanza ndio unaohitaji uchambuzi wa sarufi zaidi kwa sababu mjifunzaji huwa tayari anaweza kuwasiliana. Wapo ambao wanaamini kwamba ili kuijua lugha ni lazima kujifunza sarufi kwanza na kuielewa na wengine wana maoni ya kwamba kujifunza sarufi unachelewesha ujifunzaji wa mawasiliano na baadhi ya walimu uh, walinipa maoni kwamba wanafunzi wengi ambao tayari wanaijua sarufi ya Kiswahili kuwafunza inakuwa shida kidogo uh, hata mimi binafsi hivi vimenitokea nilipata mwanafunzi mmoja ambaye ana asili ya Canada alinomba nimfundishe noun class a uh, ili anitime uwezo wangu wa kuweza kumfundisha sarufi na kuielewa lakini mwisho wa siku kati mbinu zote ndizo zitumia uh, aliniambia na kujua hizo mbili najua kwamba a awa inakuwaje kivi inakuwaje lakini napata shida kwenye mazungumzo ni pale nilipobaini kwamba umbe unaweza ukajua usahihi lakini kama hujo soma usahihi ule pamoja na utiririkaji basi unaweza ukashindwa kutumia usahihi wako unaweza ukashindwa kuzitumia zile kanuni kama unavyotarajia kuzitumia kwa sababu kulenga sana katika mawasiliano wanafunzi wengine wapo ambao huwa wanawalaumu walimu kwa kuto kukosolewa kuna walimu hawakosoi wanafunzi wanavumilia makosa ya wanafunzi ili wale wanafunzi wapate mtiririko wa ile lugha ya Kiswahili lakini bado wanafunzi kuwalaumu wale walimu kwamba kwa dini huni kwa sawa sawiano baadaye anaeleza Asante Juma um yeah so we'll just wrap up so obviously it's a big big topic um and there's a lot to talk about and yeah I hope like, hopefully we can speak about it with other people who have lots of experience as well but to con the one conclusion we could have is that context is key or muktata ni muhimu so this could talk about context in the classroom but also the context where you're teaching um so for example some learners for example at SOAS um in a in a university young learners might be they might be okay seeing the table of noun classes maybe they can work with that but other learners might see that and just completely shut down so it's really important to like think about the learners so and also yeah so but an overemphasis on any language pedagogy and different methodologies neglects the importance of context in successful learning 
So it's more important to reflect on the learners' needs and desires and the local context. Um, and no teaching methods are exclusive. So they all have a place in a robust um, curriculum. So for example, at SOAS, we have a lecture, which is maybe a chance to be more deductive in your teaching style. And then we have the conversation class, which is maybe more chance to be inductive. So it's all about like, yeah, using different methods together. But in my experience, um, some people obviously struggle with the communicative method because they'd rather just have the rules. Maybe they're not used to, um, yeah, they're kind of used to just being explained and that's what they want. Um, but I like using this kind of inductive teaching style because it's a way of kind of having everyone together, working it out together. So in my experience, it helps like, the language kind of proceed more naturally and all learners follow the focus and no one's left behind in their explanations. Yeah. Um, and Juma, ko hitimisho? Na hitimisha ko kusema kwamba ni muhimu ujifunzaji au ufundishaji wa Kiswahili kama lugha ya asili kuzingatie lengo la maasiliano zaidi usahihi na usidhihikaji zote ni muhimu pia lakini vinapaswa kuzingatiwa kwa wakati mmoja usahihi peke yake unaleta ugumu katika mawasiliano na ujifunzaji wa usidhihikaji peke yake unaweza ukaleta makosa mengi zaidi kwa hiyo kwa jumla hivi vitu vinapaswa kusomwa kwa wakati mmoja katika hali ya utambamba. Asante sana. Yeah, asante ni sana. Asante ni. Thank you. Um, okay, now we have our final presentation for this uh, second panel, uh, Nuruliria, uh, entitled Mkata um, Milani Mutwa. So let me just one second take it all down. Um, sorry, one minute. I think it's the keyboard at one side. Go on, which, which one? Uh, yeah. Um, do I tell you what you would like to? Where is it? Oh, one second. I lost it just now. Just open it, didn't I? No, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't save it in the right place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This one. Uh, okay. It's a um. It's a PDF as well. Okay. Uh, so this is the. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I see that. I don't know. Because it's not PowerPoint, is it? No, it's a PDF. Yeah. yeah. So how do you go next, usually? I use okay, you do it. Oh, no, I can hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, my title for today is um, Katamira Nimtumwa, that is in Swahili. In English, it means a person without culture is a slave. So what do I mean by that? 
that brings me to my presentation. Um, I've worked and lived in this country for 15 years. I teach young children. So sometimes I get questions from parents. Uh, when I'm talking to parents, they'll be like, Miss Bridia, where do you from? Where do you come from originally? So questions like that. Or sometimes children will ask me, Miss Bridia, you sound weird. Yes, but how do I mute them? I think it does like next to I, don't, I think it'll be on yeah. panelists yeah. for it because it will be an apps probably. It will be Juma Juma, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, sorry. There we go. Okay, sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. So they'll ask me those questions and all of this struck me thinking, oh, so am I different? Oh, do I belong here? Maybe yes, maybe not, but I don't answer that. And this um, brings my topic. I want to talk about children's identity. So identity, there are many theories about identity. And one of them that I really love is in simple terms, it's about, um, it means who you are as a person that includes your language, your, cult your culture, your gender, your uh, ethnicity. It's everything that makes you, that is your identity. And why is it so important? Why, did, why is identity so important? Because it gives children the sense of belonging and also it gives the children confidence and self-worth. And also it gives children to, to improve their well-being in general. Because if the person is not recognized who they are, they'll get lost. So that's why it's extremely important. And that lack of lacking identity could cause isolation, confusion, and overall, it could cause serious mental health uh, problems. Right, so... You just need to click on the with the mouse on the screen and then you can use the arrows maybe. It was working. For, yeah, there you go. So how can we do this uh, in a community? So I write children's books. I started by writing children's books, just giving their ch uh, children a tool to be able to equip themselves and uh, children from my community, Swahili speakers or black children to give them that sense that they are represented in books. Because when you go to school, I know a family came to me, they said they live in Cambridge. I think it's one of the villages. They didn't have um, books in school that the little girl could you know, uh, see that she is represented. So writing books give the children uh, that um, sense of identity and also they can see that they are represented in the, in the in the society. So I've got this story here where I really love, um, I'll show you in there. There you go. So one of the pages, uh, it's just, I can read quickly. The next morning, Joe went to town and carried her magic bamboo tube with her. She waved the bamboo, bamboo magic tube to cast a spell. And it turned the beauty fingers and ears and feet of everyone who had said unkind words and um, about the color of their skin, hands, and how they spoke into bamboo, bamboo tubes, just like Bibi said. So how they spoke, because sometimes people make fun of each other. Like, you know, you speak different, that means you're different. That's just, like they, they challenge me sometimes. So I like this story because this, it. If you read the whole story, it gives you some tools on how to cope with challenges when someone makes fun of who you are. Because that's the language. The language is you. Okay? It make it part, it's part of you. You cannot separate the person and the language. Okay? So because I'm a teacher and I like participation and engagement, I would like you all, if you have, anyone has a mobile phone, a smartphone? You have a mobile phone? Yes. So I would like you to help me turn your torch on your mobile phone. If you thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's it. 
So you've got your mobile phone and touch your light on and you just say this with me to help to shine the light to the world, to those children who look different, to those children who speak different from, you know, whoever, and they are challenged constantly because of who they are. So we are going to, I'm going to ask favor to families, parents, guardian, carers, if you have young children with you, okay? Your first teachers, your first teachers, any language you speak, I'm speaking because I want to um, um, promote Swahili. So if you speak Swahili, make sure your children speak the language at home. And also schools, please stock up. If you are not, if you don't work in school and you have a friend who is a teacher or you, you can go to the schools and just ask them, they, they can have, because we have French books, we have German books, we have, uh, Spanish books, but it's you rarely, I've never worked in a school where I find Swahili books. So please challenge schools to have these uh, resources for the children. And also publishers, if you're a publisher here, try to work with um, authors to translate books, um, English books into Swahili books. And also universities as well, translate, please work with authors to translate books so that our children, our Swahili speakers, can have those books in schools and at home as well. And local authorities as well. I've got, I've worked with one of the local authorities to conduct seminars in their school so that you can provide a whole cultural experience. So I go dressed like this because I'm a little girl from Africa, from Kenya, from Tanzania. I speak Swahili, so they're curious about, you know, how do you dress like this? So that's my culture, that's my identity. So I do work with um, local authorities, schools to publish books so that children can have access to those books. Thank you so much. So you can put your torch down. Mm -hmm. Thank you for participation. And I was doing my research just to find out, just for example, in London alone, 20% of the children speak English as an additional language. So, and uh, there's three, about 300 language, languages spoken in schools. So I'm sure out of those 300 languages, Swahili will be one of them, right? There you go. So please don't um, allow us Swahili speakers children among those 300 languages to get lost um, because um we don't we don't want them to be one of those in katamil and in tuma because it's not because they don't want the language but they need us to help them to do that okay and that's my short presentation thank you so much <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, everyone. So now we are opening uh, the, um, the session for the Q&A. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, shall I just stand here? Because, or maybe I come over there with this chair. But I, anyway, I just stay here. It's okay. Uh, so any question, please, to the uh, panelists. Uh, you're welcome to raise your hand and we take like a few questions uh, before we, yeah. Okay, so we got a few. All right, lady up there, yeah? Thank you. There's a microphone. Yeah, there's a microphone, actually. This is the thing, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Mami Sewa. I'm a Ghanaian. And um, as you just spoke, I went to Ghana 2021. Children are now only speaking English, which I find it really sad. Everyone have to speak. Oh, when I ask them, don't you speak tree? Because there's variety in different uh, dialects in Ghana. When I was growing up, my mother never went to school. So we speak tree. But what is happening in Ghana? I don't know about other places. All the children are speaking English. Why? Are we shy? Are we, I tell them when you go to England, Chinese are speaking Chinese with their children, uh, French are speaking French with their children. Why we? Why aren't we proud of our language? And I speak different languages in Ghana and it's good for us, but I think the Ghanaian government 
<laughs> have to do the education, have to do something because it's a shame. Our language is our children, seven, six year old, can't speak Chi, Ga, or whatever. So thank you for bringing it up. I hope to speak to the Ghanaian government. <laughs> Anyone in the back? No comments. You okay. Okay, we take some other questions. I saw some hand. Yeah. I think I can show. Uh, Jones, uh, you spoke about uh, real language, or real meaning. Sorry, real meaning. Presumably. There is also unreal meaning. What is it? I don't understand. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think actually I had an example on this slide, which was the the long knife comes from Kenya. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a bit it's a bit abstract. So like rather than often language, it's kind of like yeah, just kind of taken out of context, and it's got no like a long knife comes from Kenya. I think it's quite a good example because it doesn't it's not really it doesn't even really make that much sense, does it? And it's kind of like not. It's not about actually communicating something in real life, like kind of trying to get your meaning across. It's just like an example you read in a textbook that shows the shows the noun classes. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, some more question over there. Hi, thank you for the very interesting presentations. Um, first question is for the the first presenter. Um, and it's basically what uh, d did you find anything out about the way these uh, varieties of language um, interact online and whether there's uh, basically a dominant version um, online or whether there's conflict between speakers of different dialects online? Uh, and another question for the, um, the Swahili teacher. Uh, uh, whether the communicate communicative method is does it neglect uh african literature as um like written language and uh yeah what are your thoughts on that and um because i feel like african languages are often viewed as just something spoken in the street by people and not a written literature and whether um yeah that's neglected and then sorry one sorry, sorry one more question <laughs> Uh, for the last speaker, um, I think we can all kind of uh, lament the fact that people lose, um, are not teaching their children their language and the loss of culture that's involved in that. But um, is it not necessary? Because a lot, a lot of people only see language as an instrumental thing, something that gives them benefits in their everyday life. Is it not necessary then to just find political ways to um make it useful to people because that's uh the reason lots of people learn or continue maintaining their languages because it's useful to, the, to them in their everyday so i feel like uh to preserve the cultural value and uh culture embedded in language you need to make it useful as well uh in everyday life and in politics and in business um and how can we do that thank you okay do you want to pick up some answers than you. Oh, okay, maybe I can quickly answer. So, yeah, thank you for the online question about online um, varieties. So we're not really or sort of systematically uh, looking at online data. Uh, anecdotally, for sure, we, I think, I screenshot a lot of tweets in Swahili that has lots of features of variation that we look at. That's always interesting. So we're not looking at it systematically, but definitely it'd be useful, uh, perhaps as a place where some of the like contact zones sort of interact in different ways. But I can tell you just anecdotally, the Aga Anga, for example, I remember interviewing a person in Tanzania where sort of, have you come across Anga rather than Aga? And their answer was, well, not here, but online is the only place where I've sort of come across Anga. So who knows if that was sort of a Kenyan participant or not. But so an interest, interesting place where maybe some of these varieties meet. So it'd be interesting to look at for sure. Yeah. And yeah, thank you for the question about the writing um, and re African literature as well. Um, yeah, no, I think like communicative method is maybe like about speaking skills a lot. But obviously, you have reading skills and writing skills. 
so yeah, it's sort of about kind of all the skills kind of simultaneously. And yeah, I guess you could also have like reading in context. So kind of, yeah, trying to have reading that's relevant. Um, but yeah, and also it depends on the level as well. So obviously like very beginner learners is kind of might not be reading too much, but as you get more like intermediate, yeah, more, more, more reading, definitely. But it's good to bring that into the, the classroom. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Dawson Mwesigwa. I study Kiswahili in Tanzania um, for secondary school. Um, my question is, um, first, thank you for brought up everything. And I have a question from first speaker and the and um adam uh the first one will be, it will be when are we going to draw a line as a scholars or as sos uh between what's correct one and what is not correct because uh uh historically uh kiswahili never been involved or wrote by original people people from from where they speak, uh, most of the time is picked up by by foreigners. From my experience, so if we keep recording things that are not correct, we might end up having incorrect. As we might not, we might normalize it, uh, especially when it's going online. So the question was, when are we going to, to draw a line, like recording the correct ones and use the rest as examples? Because otherwise. Um, uh, there was a point that it was mentioned that grammar will be challenged uh, to be to be enforced. We might end up having English Kiswahili rather than original Kiswahili. That's my point. Um, I'll, I'll keep that way. I think that might cover all of them. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do you want to answer? Yeah. yeah? You answering? Yeah, we can answer the, the the first point. So, um, at least you know the three of us we're we're linguists, so we're interested in capturing how language is used. We don't take a prescriptive approach where we think things are correct or incorrect. And in our project, we're trying to capture the variation that is out there. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting um, that you find a lot in linguistic research is people say, "No, no, no, I never use aga. You know, I always use who." And then the phone goes and they pick up the phone and they say, Nandaga. Literally, they immediately switch and they use a form that they've told you that they never use. And for us, that's really interesting because it tells us things about what they think is correct and these ideas of correctness, accuracy, you know, what it should be, which are prescribed, for example, in educational contexts, but also socially and politically, and then how people actually use language on a day-to-day -day basis and that is what we're interested in languages are all always changing so this is not unique to Swahili languages are changing all the time it's inevitable it's unstoppable it's fantastic so for us that's not a, a problem at all yeah that's obviously it's very relevant to talking about grammar and things and yeah kind of obviously have an exam so you have to kind of mark the exam to a certain extent um but yeah, it's definitely really important to highlight when you're teaching that like this might not be used in certain contexts like this doesn't really make sense in anywhere but the coast for example so you might say like if you say this in kenya you might be laughed at kind of thing like yeah we definitely try and bring that in and and also some leniency in, in exams as well like there's 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 multiple options for some like noun class agreements and stuff so there's not there's not one correct way like it can it can be in different ways Thank you. Uh, okay, we go maybe not a couple of questions. Yeah, so we go one here, one there, and then 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 we're gonna stop because there's lunch already. So I'll take three more questions. Lovely. Thank you for a very interesting panel. I just spent a week in Dar es Salaam and came away thinking people say aga a lot these days. I wasn't always sure whether it was a habitual. Sometimes it seemed to be just there, or maybe a form of emphasis. Um, and then I wondered whether you could say a little bit more on differences between Tanzanian and Kenyan mainland Swahili, which certainly when you talk to Tanzanians, they, they, they sort of complain almost about Kenyan Swahili, you know. And my impression is that the, the, the noun class system seems to work quite well on the on the Tanzanian mainland, in, in, in my, my experience, and rather less so in Kenya. And I also wonder on the presentation on uh, Kingwana, 
talking to people who work in that region, what they comment on most actually is the influence of French. And um, I wonder, since your sources for the paper seem to be mostly Anglophone missionaries, do they, do they actually respond to that? Are they worried about too much French? Does it occur at all? Nico, yeah, last question. Okay, I'll take uh, one more question, or shall we answer quickly? Take Maybe one go is, rela is it related? It's related. It's related. Okay, so let's take uh, this one more way. Thank you. It's just a reflection on standardization because Kiswahili is being taught in schools now across different countries, and also it's the official language of the African Union. And there's an a uh, there's a UN Day for Kiswahili. And I think some of the issues that we're speaking to here have something to do with this both local and international and across border use of Kiswahili, because I've heard this Kenya, Tanzania, coast, you know, and it works. The languages work in all their locations. Is there going to be an Institut International de Kiswahili as the French have? And what's the way forward? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll check also now. I think enough from the audience. If yeah, Nico answered the question since that was once. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Nico, um, yes. yeah, as you can, yeah, did you hear the question? Yeah, the first one concerning the Kingwana, right? Yeah, <clears throat> your answer then. Yeah, very briefly. Uh, um, by that time, there was not much French uh, influence, actually, as you said. Um, these were uh, uh, Anglophone missionaries, of course, um, and French was, especially in that part of the Congo, not yet very widespread. So that's the 1905 and so on, you know, because the official Belgian colony started in 1908. Um, but of course, uh, um, the Belgians who were in the area spoke French, but up to that point, it was really the lingua franca of these areas, like up to the 1890s and 1910s was Swahili mostly, more than any other language, only in the north, maybe Zande or, or Arabic especially. But um, that came later, the influence uh, of French. So practically when uh, the colony took over, over and also imposed French as official language. So increasingly you notice over, if you look at a religious material from the 20s, 30s, 40s onward, you notice a, an influence from French, not only coming directly from French, also via Lingala, which at some point um, increased in usage in, in, in to some degree. But at that point, um, French was only among colonial officers, uh, practically a language widely used. And they are not these contact features that we notice today when we look at, or even over the past uh, 50 years or so, uh, or, or 70 years, when we look at um, sources, for example, from Lubumbashi or from Goma or Bukavu and so on. But it's a very, very interesting question, the, in, the influence of, of Anglo Phone missionaries and of English as a language too, not only in that region, also in Katanga, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you very much. Um, also from the online, there was a comment for um, Funuru's presentation. Uh, if you, we can read it. Um, it's not a question, it's a comment following Nuru's presentation. I am a marine scientist, but I've translated several books so that the layman can understand them and um, as well as translated school children books. Uh, so it's just sort of sharing that with us. Um, and uh, yeah, so perhaps uh, you want to also answer on, yeah? Um, yeah, in terms of your question about the difference between Kenyan and Tanzanian, um, I think it comes down to a, a question of the sort of linguistic marketplace. Obviously, Kiswahili was very much involved in a project of nation building in Tanzania, Whereas to quote uh, Prof. Githiora, Swahili policy has been quite flip-flopping and ambivalent in Kenya. So I think the sort of status solidarity uh, functions of Swahili and English in Tanzania are quite different. That could be part of the reason why the grammar is a bit looser in Kenya. And in terms of starting a Swahili institute, um, I think there are such projects at, for example, University of Dar es Salaam. But yeah, again, we sort of reject wholeheartedly the prescriptivist paradigm. It, it's all tied into language and power um, and censorship. So I think it's good to appreciate variation in language. Um, and it makes it more democratic as well, because people can speak however they want and be heard and yeah, valued. 
And just to respond on the UG, yeah. Yeah, and just very quickly, uh, definitely we are looking at data where this suffix UG is used in context where it doesn't seem to strictly be to do with habitual. So like we have data from Iringa, for example, and there we have one of the examples we often quote is Bajaji drivers saying, Tuendage, Tuendage, or let's go. And there really doesn't seem to be anything about habitual. Mm. So how is maybe expanding into different functions? Uh, so yeah, we, we can tell you more maybe in the break, but we have definitely a lot of data that we are looking at where it seemed to have uh, broadened sort of its scope, or maybe just also we are looking at other languages where ag very much is and maybe has other functions than habitual, whether these are also taken into uh, sweat in places. So uh, yeah, good question and a really interesting area. Okay, um, are there any more questions? Yes, okay, so, um, all right, I'm just checking the time because, um, all right, maybe we've got another few minutes while I'm setting the lunch. So if you don't mind, I'll just take one more, more person up there. And then that would be the last question because then we're having the Swahili lunch, but they asked me to hold on. Okay. Of <laughs> <laughs> it's the last question, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Aidan Mwambeki. I come from um, an architecture background, so I just loved uh, attending this. My question is to Nuru. Um, um, the question is, do you think the issue is um, the society setting an influ and, uh, influence uh, that the kids go through when they're younger uh, in terms of uh, learning the language? I've got three uh, siblings who are under 10 and their Swahili is horrible. I don't let them speak in public because this <laughs> <clears throat> and the issue is that when they go to school, they study in English and when they come back home, their form of entertainment, cartoons and uh, illustrations are in English or most of them in English and they're more appealing. So there is one in Swahili. I don't know any of you have seen Kiriku. It's a short animation. It really, when you sit down and you compare that to, um, let's say, uh, Pepper Pigs or Generator X, which is a lot of uh, uh, flames and throwing and running, and it's more appealing. So they choose to watch something that's more appealing. And my brother sounds like one of the cartoon characters when he's speaking English. So... And then I've been trying to find the stories I read when I was younger, but they're all in just literature. Nothing is illustrative that they could, you know, look at and enjoy. So stories like um, Yogoa Maajabu, you have to create your own imagination. But yet when they see an English book, it's these colorful pictures and, and horizons and things like that. So do you think the issue is there that we need to start um, uh, sort of encourage the narrative, but not in uh, just literature? but in a sort of more of illustrative way. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. That's a brilliant question. I think the issue there is the attitude. So if you feel your language is inferior, you will think it's not as good as other languages. You see, and that comes from us as parents. We have to be role models because I speak to some parents who have, okay, let's start, live on the um, language, hair. African parents, they'll say, oh, can you do, they go to the hairdresser and say to put extension on a five-year-old, blonde extensions, so that the hair looks like their friend's hair. And that is a terrible mistake because you're losing the point here. You need to tell your child they've got beautiful Afro hair. That's their hair and it's beautiful and natural, you see. So, and also, when it comes, exactly when it comes to food, I hear parents say, this one doesn't like Ugali. Ugali is African, so, you know, it's made maize or something like a porridge, it's not porridge, it's like bread, yeah. and. Parents were saying that in front of the child, like this one doesn't like, you know, Kenyan food or whatever. And I'm thinking, you don't say that. You say, oh, we love Ugali, Ugali. You know, as a parent, so you need to show your children these are nice things. So we get it wrong, but us not setting the example, you see. So attitude is the first thing. Then children will love it. 
Yeah. So I've got the characters in my book. I said, God willing, one day, if there are characters, you know, if the animation is done, if I get someone to do the illustration, well, the illustrations are beautiful. But if we get, you know, TV series of things like that, they're beautiful. It's just how we see things. Yeah. Huh? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the lunch is waiting outside. Swahili food, uh, amazing food coming from, um, you know, all the way from Leicester, from an incredible chef. So I hope you will enjoy the lunch break. Uh, we can still have a conversation, chatting uh, in the while we're having lunch. Apologies if I couldn't answer all the questions. And please, can we come back here in an hour? Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Abibi namabana mnansikia nyuma uko. Ah uh, vizuri asante. Ah uh, kwanza natoa shukrani kwa Ida kwa Angelica kwa wote waandalizi uh, wa baraza hili. Na pia na furaha sana na moyoni kwa vile naona watu ambao hatukutana kwa miaka wengine tumekutana juzi juzi tu kwa hivyo mnashukuru sana. Uh, asante na tutaanza sasa lakini sasa na nitabadili lugha nitaingia kiingereza kwa hivyo kwa hivyo sasa uh, two or three years ago i think there was a symposium in germany on shaban robert and uh, at that time while the speakers were giving their papers a thought sort of uh, occurred in my mind that it would be good to look at uh, what i've called the twin works of uh, Shaban uh, Robert. These are very early uh, prose works and uh, therefore I sort of began thinking about it and where I am now currently, if you look at your programs and you look at the title, there's a difference. On the program I had written perspectives, thinking that I'll have all those covered by the time I come to this podium, but actually <laughs> it has sort of become a notion. Yes, so, so it's just a a notion which I am playing with it in currently and I'm hoping that you will also contribute to it. So what are those those twin works? Uh, Angelica? What will be Click on the screen with the mouse for one second and then it should be possible to... Okay. 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 Try again. Okay. Good, thank you. Uh, these are the twin works. That is uh, Shaban Roberts Kufikirika and Kusadikika, uh, 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 two of them. And I've called them twins um, because there are resemblances. They're not identical twins, but there are resemblances between the two. Uh, Kufikirika, 1946, his uh, introduction uh, Tanga, 1946. It was published uh, Kusadikika in 1948 and then published 1951. It might have been published earlier, but uh, we stick with 1951 at, at the time. There is a sort of a linguistic similarity in their titles. I mean, you have the coup and the stative, so you, and, and you have... So the way I thought it might be translated and perhaps you might want to translate differently, is it to think of it as the thinkable and the credible. So uh, imaginary countries, both of them. And of course, these are allegorical narratives. And uh, perhaps he was hinting at something when he wrote these two books, which have such uh, unique titles of uh, Kirika and, okay. and to me, I felt perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll come back to uh, to this later, but what do they represent? They represent Kufikirika and Inchi Moja Kuba Katika Nchi Zadunia, which means that is on earth. And the other one is Kusadikika. It, in the book itself has the subtitle Nchi Ilio Angani. And of course it is allegorical. And of course, we know that allegory, when you start into pretty allegory, it stretches. I mean, you can stretch it to whichever extent you like till it becomes sort of a faint 
Yeah, but let's see how we proceed. So my cue, I take it from a recent article by Anne-Marie Drury, who used to be here at SOAS at one point. Uh, she has written very recently in Modern Philology um, on Shaban Robert's Swahili Rubaiyat and its reckonings. So what is the Rubaiyat? This is the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and uh, well-known in the West by, through the translation by Edward Fitzgerald, who incidentally is honored uh, by SOAS when you go to the first floor of uh, SOAS and you go going into the senior common room or staff room is now called, you have a stone there just in front of the lift and it is uh, uh, um, as a tribute, I think, to, to Fitzgerald. Anyway, the first line which I've given the article is really, that's my cue. How should we understand lit literary translation in the colonial milieu? And my, I'm removing translation. I'm putting uh, uh, in its place uh, uh, prose. How should we understand literary prose in a colonial milieu? Now, Shaban Robert was born January 1909. He died just after Tanzania or Tanganyika's independence in uh, 1962. So really virtually the whole of his life was spent in a colonial milieu, uh, the German and then the and then uh, the, the British. So these are the two works I thought I would look at. But of course, talking of literature in, in an assembly within 20 minutes, has its hazards. And one of the hazards is, of course, uh, you have to tell, say, unless you all have read it, I have to tell you what the plot is. So now that will take another 10 minutes, but but I'll try to rush through it as much as I, I, I can. So here you are, Kufikirika. What is Kufikirika? Well, what is the plot? It's Mfalme, a king, a sultan, who, 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 is, who is without an heir. Okay, and then he calls upon the Waganga of uh, Kufikirika, could you help me? One very distinguished Mganga uh, says, yes, uh, I will help you, but I won't. he predicts that of course the queen will have a, a baby, but during the 10th year of the child's uh, bringing, uh, he will fall sick, he will fall ill. And the only way to actually get him better again would be if two people are, are, are hanged or slain, whatever. And those two people, now of course, Kufikirika is a very law abiding uh, country. So the law has to be changed in order to, to look for two people who can be killed. Okay, so now in the meantime, um, this boy while he's growing up is given a very good teacher, but the teacher has, has a particular sort of character because he is sort of somebody who transcends boundaries. So what he does, the, the, the Sultan gives him particular subjects that is his curriculum uh, and asks him specifically that just teach my son these subjects. That teacher doesn't. So very secretly sort of he mixes classroom uh, education with sports He's a great believer in sports, okay? And, and he teaches him new subjects. And of course, when the Sultan comes to know about it, he dismisses him. And, and then another teacher is employed who reverts to the old method. And of course, this English phrase, all work, no, no play makes Jack a dull boy. In his case, it, it makes him ill, very ill. And of course, this, this is in the 10th year. So that prediction, in a way has come uh, to fruition. And uh, now the two people have to be uh, sought, but there was also another condition that these two people in the whole of the Kufikirika, one has to be Merevo, a very clever person, and one has to be a Mjinga, a very a stupid fool. Okay, so now how do you go about looking for these two people? Eventually they do get them. Okay, so they are put in, in, in prison for a little while, awaiting uh, the day and time when they can be killed. And they start talking, these two. And of course, it, 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 it uh, becomes very clear 
that actually the Murevu is the Mjinga, and the Mjinga is Murevu. So you have this uh, this this uh, 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 reversal. So you have these reverse uh, characteristics, as it were. Okay, now uh, the main character of Kusadi Kika. Uh, I'll go through this very quickly. Is uh, Karama, and he wants to institute the practice of advocacy uh, in in Kusadi Kika because they do believe in laws. But the, all the laws are passed by the Falme in presence in the court, and, and no lawyers are, are, are allowed. So Karama then, the king agrees that Karama can put his case. And then ironically, what Karama does by his arguments being heard in the court, uh, in the presence of the king every day for a week, is actually a lawyer practicing his trade. So you have you have this... This type of so I'll just uh, leave it there, and uh, I'm rushing through, so I'm going very quickly to okay. What are the when you look at these two novels, what are the takeaways uh, for us? Especially now, keeping in mind two ingredients, two things. One is that Shaban Robert was uh, living at a time when the British were in power, when it's very slowly. The Africa Association was established, and you're beginning all these historical elements uh, of uh, political consciousness, fighting for freedom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He could not participate in that because he was a civil servant, and he was uh, he was uh, uh, forbidden uh, from doing that. And he talks about this in uh, his his biography, My uh, Shayangu, and then Badamiaka Hamsini. So, but. Let us, as I said earlier, these allegories, they can be stretched. Okay, I'm taking the liberty of stretching them a bit. So let us see what we, what are the ingredients we, we, we take away. First of all, Shaban Roberts' very broad sort of understanding of governance. It's not governance to him, it's not just government uh, in relation to how the government, or rather to how it, it, it governs, but in doing so, it is in relation to other institutions within the country, what we today call these civil society organizations. And in these three, you have these, in these two books, you have these three aspects standing out, education, uh, medicine, and law. So these are the aspects he's really talking, relating to, to governance. And in both books, right from the beginning to the end, the public is engaged, uh, especially in Kusadi Kika. The public is engaged almost uh, every day from the beginning. And in both, emphasis is placed on the rule of law and fairness. And, and there is a quest, a search on how this can be achieved for the public good. Now, interpolate that into this colonial aspect and you begin to see to, to find some some answers so let's move very quickly uh, to my second uh, slide on the ingredients now shaman robert's thoughts first of all on modern pedagogy uh, that you don't just put a, a, a child in a, in a classroom and just throw facts at him or her you know, he, they need to 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 play so he he took sports as a very serious subject and then he also talked about new knowledge, how we need to accept new knowledge and uh, how to pay heed to, especially to the medicine brought by the Waganga. And he says this in his novel, who have crossed Baharia Ufaulu, the, the ocean of success, and have come to Kufikirika. And we need to, to pay heed to those, to listen to those and to practice their medicine. What is Baharia Kufaulu? Uh, I can say it's the Indian Ocean. I've seen it, perhaps it's uh, the way that you know people have come into East Africa from the the other countries, etc. And so, not only new knowledge as such, but also specifically new knowledge in in um, in in medicine. And and he explains where you will get this in that paragraph on page. Uh, well, I haven't got the page number, but he, he explains this 
And then he says, mahali pa, mahali pa kazi ya uganga wao. Okay, okay. Huitua hospitali. Okay, so you, that's, that's uh, a clue for you. What he has in mind uh, as such. And then lo and behold, that young man who is very ill, then the father then agrees to send him to the, to the hospital and he's steward. Okay, so that becomes the uh, story. Okay, now I'm stretching it a bit. I would like to look at what is meant by this Mjinga and Mwerevu. Mjinga and Mwerevu, uh, they, they, there is a reversal. And here I'm very tempted to see this as a comment on the British uh, practice or policy of uh, ethnic stratification, where you had the Europeans and you had then in between the Arabs and the Indians who fought for uh, uh, who comes next. And then you have uh, uh, the the Africans and of course the Swahili were included in that. And then in Mombasa, some Swahili appealed say, no, no, we are not uh, Swahili. My name is uh, Mohammed Sayyid Al something. So that Al something put me in the Arab category. So you have that. Uh, and uh, there's an author called uh, uh, Sheikh Haider Al-Kindi, and if you read his biography, uh, it's wonderful. I would, I would uh, uh, recommend it. It's called it Life, Life and Times or, or, or Political Time, something such, but it's Haider Al-Kindi, and he has a footnote there. And he said, we, the Swahili, are like bats, you know, B-A-T-S, Batman, uh, bats. Okay, okay. <laughs> the, the birds think we are animals, and the animals think we are birds. So we are, we are sort of uh, uh, in between. So so anyway, but I would like to see that perhaps Shaman Robert was looking at this and perhaps he was talking about Mjinga Namrevu, that the time comes when the two sort of reverse orders, that those colonized uh, whom you thought to be stupid uh, are now really showing how clever they are as and, and vice versa. Of course, I would not like to stretch it uh, uh, too far, you know, but but uh, at least that is the So uh, uh, how am I doing for time? I, I haven't been shown the five minutes. <laughs> yeah, you, oh, you have, okay, I didn't see it. Okay, right, so, okay. So in that case, I'll go to my last slide. It's just, just right, actually, that this is perfectly timed. And I thought that I will end I will end this by by uh, thinking about my own work. When I was doing this, this playing around with this notion, I looked at my own my own plays. So I have three plays: uh, uh, Mfalme Juha, I have uh, Alion Japepo, and I have a third play which is living up to its name. A series. Nobody knows about it. <laughs> you see this series. So I don't think there's anyone here who has probably read Siri. Okay, right. So uh, what is what what is the structure in these three? And I was really amazed to look at it that they all have this central authority uh, in all the three, like like Shab and Robert. Uh, in both there are Kusadikika and Kufkirika, there's the Sultan. And I thought you have in Falman, you had the very title, Falman, that character. He's a king, he's a sultan. And then you go to Alianja Pepo, you don't see him, but there is this somebody called Bam Kuba, uh, the, 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 the big man. And all the action sort of is, is, is propelled in a sense by him because he is the upper one in, in heaven. And then of course you have Siri, which you haven't read, but I'll tell you, that it is you have, there also you have uh, a sultan. So when I started thinking about it, and then I thought perhaps it's my own upbringing as well. Looking, listening to all these uh, stories of the of Al Flela Unela, which talks of sultans and all. And then of course it was the, the Zanzibar Sultanate. And then I came to this country long ago in 1960 with a passport which said British protected person of Zanzibar. You know, so, so I thought perhaps that might have also um, influenced me unconsciously. And uh, so therefore you have this. So I'm now, if, if at all, 
absolutely good. One minute. So if at all, <laughs> if at all, I do veer away from this now. I hope it will be to write something in a very sort of uh, uh, unauthorized un or un, I don't know what's the word, uncentered, uh, non-centered uh, political uh, 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 milieu. Thank you very much. I think it's Yes, Thank I'm John Boma Bibina Mabana. About it, I'm China. Uh, my name is Ding Ling, and I'm a postgraduate student from Beijing Foreign Studies University. Uh, today, my topic is translations of British literature into Kiswahili and the paradox of literary modernity in the colonial context. It will be divided into five parts, and uh, I'm going to discuss a relationship between translation and uh, literary modernity, and uh, the colonial ideology and the selection of literary texts, also translation strategies, and uh, I'm going to briefly re-evaluate the first generation of Swahili novels. Well, I think in today, uh, in a globalized world, political and economic progress in various nations has fostered uh, increased cultural diversity. Uh, civilizations, nations, and cultures once marginalized under Western hegemony um, can now wield influence on the international stage. So the modernity, the, this concept becomes more complicated. And instead of a concept that is, def that is only defined by Western paradigms. Uh, so I think there's a need for us to reconsider this co concept under various contexts. And uh, there are many research on Swahili literary translations. However, there's still a gap regarding the underexplored domain of literary modernity. Uh, and uh, there's still a lack of enough translations, uh, enough research on translations during British colonial period. And I think many of them didn't contextualize the relationship between translations, power, and literary modernity. So my research analytical perspective is from unequal power relations in cultural exchange. I'm going to ask who defined the concept of literary modernity and what's the rationale and the methodology behind its definition. Can colonial literary translations be seen as um, modernity, or do they reflect the unequal power dynamics or ideologies of British um, creators? And modernity is a concept characterized by its dynamic and unstable nature. Uh, I think whatever the Western scholars or Chinese scholars uh, may hold different attitudes toward this concept, and there are already many interpretations of modernity. So I just conclude some keywords, um, which are fluid, ever-changing, dynamic, um, progress, novel, revolutionary. Uh, I think in one word, um, modernity is progressiveness. And literary modernity is intricately intertwined with the social development. For example, in Western literature, it aligns precisely with the modernization of society. Um, and there exists a mutual influence between literature and society. So in my opinion, literary modernity has the potential to instigate positive changes in society to a certain extent. Um, however, modernity is a concept um, often defined by powerful nations. 
So how can an underdevelopment society attain modernity? Well, I think uh, until presently, until recently, many scholars claim that uh, the societies can attain this kind of modernity uh, in various ways. Translation is one of the most important ways. Um, just like Pascal Casanova highlights, translation is a mechanism of consecration in literary world. And also Chinese scholar Luo Xuanming uh, states that translation can introduce new vocabulary, syntax, literary forms and expressions. For example, in modern China, uh, translation has made substantial contributions to the development of language, literature, and even society. However, every coin has two sides um, because translation is can be an ideologically influenced tool um, capable of challenging the prevailing literary values of the target society and disseminating discourse, consolidating power. So many scholars actually base their conclusions on the presumption of native or local translators. But what about another situation uh, that, which is dominated by foreign translators or exogenous translators. Um, for example, in during the colonial period, uh, there's obvious unequal power of translators because foreign translators, or should I say British translators, were dominant in the whole process while the locals were marginalized. And their objectives can be quite different from the Normal, uh, normal one where we often speak. Uh, for example, they, their translations aimed at consolidating colonial power and colonial discourse, uh, providing limited education to the colonized, and challenging the liter traditional literary values while concurrently uh, constructing the new one that aligns with their paradigms. So, asymmetrical power relations could significantly. Um, influence the definition and the shape and uh, formation of uh, modernity. And in the next part, I will discuss um, colonial ideology power and the selection of literary texts. Well, my focus will be on the reasons of the selection of popular literature, why they were chosen. Um, there were some driving forces, as we all know, standardization of Kiswahili, uh, construction of a a colonial educational system, civilizational mission. And here I want to add one more thing, which is uh, Orientalist bias. Um, as you can see, I listed some translated uh, British literature here, uh, Treasure Island, uh, King Solomon's Mines, uh, Gulliver's Travels, and so on, which are uh, almost Victorian novels. And I categorized them into two groups, which are colonial literature represented by King Solomon's Mice and the other with uh, less colonial tendency or orientation represented by Gulliver's Travels and Alice in Wonderland. Uh, however, they also share some common features, which are um, conquest, imperialism, adventure, global travel, which are closely associated with uh, colonial expansion, and they are popular fiction. Uh, however, even though they are popular fiction, I agree with that they have uh, specific functions in different societies. Uh, for example, in British society, they educated, uh, shaped cultural identity and imperial consciousness. Uh, and in East African society, they can stimulate imagination, creativity, reifying the perception about the self and the other, and consolidating colonial power and the discourse. So to a limited extent, I think they actually showed some aspects of literary modernity in secularism, new literary regiones and uh, life experiences and thoughts. However, they couldn't uh, represent the literary modernity capable of instigating positive so social changes. I mean, if the colonizers truly wanted to introduce literary modernity, why the uh, Charles Dickens works or James Joyce works were absent. Uh, why were just th this um, popular literature were chosen? And in the next part, I'm going to discuss the translation strategies and the distortion of this kind of literary modernity. Uh, here I, well, I think there are actually many translation strategies during that time, but um, I conclude them into three words, simplification, deletion, and reconstruction. 
Um, so why did they happen? Uh, here I want to mention the Orientalist bias because Kiswahili was regarded as inadequate for adopting advanced and valuable literary works. And local individuals may be mischaracterized as not being attuned to more complex ideas or advanced thought. So in this sense, they changed the original texts in, should I say, completely or significantly. For example, simplification. Well, many intricate portrayals of the environment, characters, actions, event details, and so on, were simplified, and also literary expressions and uh, um, some straightforward linguistic strategies were adopted. And I think deletion is actually more important than simplification, because deletion uh, made the whole original text uh, look like very strange. Um, and so narratives that did not fit the colonial discourse were removed or altered. And uh, if you look at uh, every front page of the trans translated text, you can see uh, this sentence, Kitabu kime fupishu ana kuwa ndi kwa upia na basi hapa tuna hitaji kuuliza kwa kiaxi gani vi mea ndi kwa upia. Yeah, to... to uh, and to some extent, I would like to call it a reconstruction, because several texts underwent extensive alterations to the extent that they were stripped of their original value and the meaning, such as Gulliver's Travels, uh, which will be discussed in uh, later, and Alice in Wonderland. Uh, here, I want to give two examples, uh, but of King Solomon's Mines uh, uh, representing colonial literature and uh, the other ones, Gulliver's Travels representing uh, the uh, other K, uh, groups. Uh, so here you can say that simplification. In chapter 16, this whole narrative was simplified to just one sentence. So you can see actually Haggard described uh, this, this sculptures and this environment in a very detailed way. However, in Johnson's translation, we can only say one sentence, which is how to own a sanam tatuna kadikari akila sanam na mwenzake ili kuwa nafasi ya hatuwa shilin. Na wote wanatazama wanda walo, sanam mbili izi likuwa za wanawume, na ile ya tatu ili kuwa ya mwana mke. Just, just very simple one sentence. And the next is deletion of specific narratives. This, as we know, the, um, the King Solomon's Mines actually uh, aims at uh, portraying white men as saviors and gods um, of black people. However, this one uh, stated by Ignacy uh, ran, ran counter to the original uh, aim of the, of the author uh, because mm, he stated that uh, white men will not be allowed to go into his reign anymore. And in the same vein, the concluding portion was also removed, uh, involving a letter penned by Sir Henry to court mine that underscores the potential for amassing wealth through the acquisition of those diamonds. Well, in plain terms, um, white men were described as avaricious and greedy uh, in this letter. So um, this letter is actually not f uh, fitted uh, into the colonial discourse. And the next one is Gulliver's Travels. I think this translation was significantly abridged. I couldn't call it um, a sat satirical uh, novel. Uh, instead, uh, rather, I would like to call it a travelogue. It was totally changed. Um, for example, the chapters of La Puta and the Huimin which serve as biting satire of British society during a certain era were completely excised. And uh, the translator extensively altered the contents of the remaining chapters, resulting in a complete departure of the intended meaning of the original text. For example, as you can see here, um, in chapter six, substantial portions of spherical descriptions were deleted, including criticisms of the legal system, the selection of officials, uh, crafty theft and educational practices, and also um, the satire targeting monarchy in chapter seven and criticism against European philosophy were all gone. And the description of beggars in chapter four was also removed. 
However, what was remained uh, was the main contents, which uh, were actually lacking of logic. And you can see it's it's it just like uh, a literature for children, and it's it was actually for children. However, in in this sense, I would like to add that uh, translation sh should be for children and for adults. However, in, during colonial period, there was only this kind of translation for children. There was no uh, other translations for adults of Gulliver's Travels. So uh, behind this uh, kind of phenomenon, I would like to call it an unequal power relations because the British translators were actually dominant in never link of the translation. So they shaped the ultimate uh, form of the of the translations. And there's an obvious transcendence of power uh, because translation should have been a multifaceted process engaged by different stakeholders, such as uh, publishers, editors, translators, uh, reviews, and even government officials. However, there were only colonizers in dominating in the whole process. And so, these translators can assume the role of authors in the whole translation process, just like uh, the, the sentence you saw in the previous uh, PowerPoints. So, does he have the power, authority to uh, rewrite or to um, make so, so much changes to uh, to the original text? Well, in my opinion, I think um, the authors actually did not have these powers to do that. And ob uh, obviously, local translators were marginalized and silenced. So in this sense, the literary modernity emanating from this kind of strategies and uh, popular literature or simplify linguistic styles uh, represented a cultural hegemony. Uh, because um, simplified and colloquialist translate were considered emblematic of literary modernity, uh, backed by both colonial authorities and policies and institutions that supported this concept. Because when we analyzed from a linguistic view, uh, we can we, maybe maybe we can say that uh, the literary expressions in Swahili poetry or Tanzi uh, can be more modern, and these newcomers can be deemed as backward and uh, uh, regressive. So, in the last part, I will briefly reevaluate uh, the modern Swahili novels based on this kind of literary modernity. So in the politicized context, new thoughts, genres, and expressions are not completely equal to literary modernity. Uh, we should ask that, is there the, the ability to make a complete story, uh, conveying new thoughts and adopting new genres can be deemed as modern, or is there more to it? Uh, because when we look at Uhuru Wa Watumwa and other novels under the influence of literary translations, such as we can see that they are actually translations of translations. And even Sherman Robert, uh, the Kusadi Kika, is ac actually uh, an obvious imitation of Gulliver's Travels. And in his works, uh, we know that there is an obvious utopianism. However, is this utopianism uh, coming from uh, his life experiences or just Swahili oral stories or Arabic stories, well, I think there's another one, which is Victorian idealism. Uh, because this kind of uh, idealism uh, underscores uh, that every man can attain a success and wealth by diligence. And uh, there's always a happy ending or triumphed endings. Um, and also, uh, Sheban Roberts advocates for Tawala Bola instead of questioning the legitimacy of colonial rule. Because in his works, we can uh, see that good leaders uh, should possess the uh, ability to, to uh, put the well-being of the nation at the forefront and should be open to views. So um, is, does that imply that any leaders possessing those qualities can be deemed as good leaders, even if colonizers. So I think I take this uh, phenomenon of 
uh, Swahili novels as the as the perpetuation of unequal power relations, because the initial Swahili novels lacked advanced narrative techniques and achieved uh, and received limited attention from Western literary critics, who view, often viewed them as culturally backward and unsophisticated. For example, in the 1960s, what was referred to as modern Swahili literature actually mirrored the simpler and outdated literary forms that had been prevalent in Britain a century prior. And literary modernity in this context serves as a mechanism of consecrating power because by doing so, dominant uh, nations can, in the literary world, can, with the uh, various forms of capitals and power, uh, can be con can continue to exert influence of literary criticism and shape the definition of literary modernity according to their paradigms and discourse. And uh, well, in the end, let me briefly conclude my presentation. I think uh, literary translations actually uh, in the colonial context served as conduits for British ideology with works being carefully selected or meticulously modified to resonate with the colonial discourse power and ideology. Mm, so when translations serve as a vehicle uh, for perpetuating colonial discourse modernity in this sense becomes um, a paradoxical term, because we can see that there are uh, limited literary expressions on sophisticated structures and on and simple language and diminished literary values. And new thoughts is actually paradoxical, as you can see uh, in those presented in many novels of the first generation. So, and also literary modernity is uh, should have been a deep politicized aesthetic concept. However, in this context, it becomes a politicized and ideologically influenced definition. And um, also the production of knowledge, and here I um, think it's um, a translation, in the colonial era was actually linked to the asymmetrical power relations. And these disparities in power were perpetuated, represented by the first generation of uh, Swahili novels. Uh, for example, adult children relationship in the colonial paradigm was consolidated, which means sophisticated and unsophisticated. And uh, we can see that power significantly shaped literary modernity, leading to distinct outcomes in the Swahili literature context where it perpetuated its subordinate status and uh, maintained it, the Western literary modernity in a superior standing. And also literary modernity is a criterion for the perpetuation of unequal power as it is defined by certain nations according to their own interests and values, rather than reflecting the diversity and the complexity of the other in their sense. And that's all about my presentation. Thank you very much. Make a move You send me. I, I send one photo. Yeah, I'll, I'll open it. Shall I? Yes, yeah. please do. Yeah, so I'll have to just hold on one minute. I have to just Sorry, one sec. If you want to start. Or... Okay. I'll start talking while Angelica pulls up my one and only slide. Um, I want to thank both Ida and Angelica for fitting me into the program at short notice. It's a real pleasure being here. For reasons too long to explain, I don't have a proper presentation, but I have an image that I'll come to in due course. Um, what I'm about to talk about is not really about literature or language as an object of inquiry. It's about the question of what can be said or not in a particular context. Um, and I need to mention that this is actually arising from a collaborative research project funded by the EU that has over the last four years taken place in sites in southern Tanzania, western Tanzania, southern Uganda, eastern Kenya, and the eastern DRC, um, with collaborators including Salvatore Nianto and Nives Kinunda from the University of Dar es Salaam, 
Doreen Kimbabazi, now of Warwick, uh, Clelia Curé of the French Institute in Nairobi, and Marco Lecfasil of Free University Brussels. So, to start the subject, um, 1922 was the 100th anniversary. Just put it now, then yeah. it's, it's done. It's, I think it's okay if it's there. Um, so, nine, sorry, 2022 was the 100th anniversary of the official abolition of slavery in mainland Tanzania in 1922. Um, I have looked and with my best efforts, I have not been able to find any indication of any kind of official memorialization of what arguably by many standards would be a momentous centenary. Um, there is similar avoidance of the topic also in Kenya, where Kenya and the islands of Zanzibar, where the 100th anniversary took place somewhat earlier. Um, now, when it comes to this overall fairly consistent silence on the history of slavery and its end, um, there are some fairly obvious reasons. Firstly, there is timing itself. Uh, emancipation in East Africa was a process that occurred over years and decades, and these actual dates of ordinances, declarations, aren't necessarily terribly meaningful they don't actually mark the point when emancipation really happened for a great majority of the people affected. Um, another reason that is fairly evident is the very manifest orientation of East African governments and the Tanzanian government in particular towards the future, what has been described as its pronounced developmentalism. Yeah, where the past mostly functions as a sort of quarry of materials that can affirm the political dis dispensation of the present and in some way or another contribute towards an imagined better future. Um, there is also another factor which is hard to trace in any kind of explicit pronouncement, but is quite manifest if you look at um, certain broader discourses about history. Um, briefly put, uh, abolitionist narratives such as they are in East Africa have arguably quite divisive implications. That is to say, for Christians, there is a way in which abolition slash emancipation and Christianization and then the development of modern nation states are all part of the same process, yeah? leading Africans out of a dark past of enslavement and disunity into a better present of Christianity and nation states. This is certainly in the case of Tanzania, this is sometimes quite explicit. There are some <laughs> Pentecostal churches that are really quite explicitly nationalist at the same time, and there are similar iterations of that also in Kenya. Uh, obviously, for Muslim people in the East African nations, this kind of narrative is rather more complicated, but the Christian version just doesn't work. Um, Muslims rather tend to categorize uh, enslavement in the past as an Arab custom rather than an Islamic institution and emphasize the importance of manumission, the abolitionist tendencies, if you will, in Islam itself. Nevertheless, there is clearly in the Christian version of this narrative a certain potential for scapegoating yeah, of um, Muslim people in the region, um, which may well contribute to a certain official wariness around addressing uh, the history of slavery in the region. But I would argue that perhaps more important than any of these factors is a phenomenon that is very much 
evident at the grassroots. It's, it's evident if you talk to people in communities where slavery once existed, yeah? um, which could be termed the unspeakability of the history of slavery today. The, there's a lot of strangely consistent, often um, discursive strategies whereby the topic is sort of stepped around. Um, the question, or one of the questions that I'm asking myself is whether this can be seen or should be seen as an indication of a persisting hegemony on part of slave descendants of slave owners who are in a sense let off the hook, or whether it can or should also be seen as an indication of a kind of moral victory on part of slave descendants. So what happens there is that if you talk to people in locations um, where there once were plantations worked by slaves, um, you are very likely to hear sentences such as, there were lots of slaves here once, and their descendants are still around. Oh, really? Well, who are they? Well, we can't tell you. I, either, either we don't know or, or we can't say. Yeah? So this is a line that I have heard from so many people in, in, in different settings who've asked questions about the slave past. We know who the slave descendants are, but we only talk about that in private, if at all. Um, and there, there are certain terms that aren't slave descendant or something like that, but somehow evoke that status. Yeah? So I've heard state, statements like that in conversations with descendants of plantation owners, some of whom were apologists for slavery and basically said, well, slave descendants still know their place, really. Yeah. So in that case, there is almost a note of triumph in, in these claims. Yeah. As if they're saying, well, we let them get away with pretending that they are our equals. But they are not, and they know that we know that they're not. Yeah. At the same time, though, um, this avoidance, yeah, this unspeakability appears to be also quite consistently maintained by the descendants of the formerly enslaved. The most sort of vivid example of that um, that I have derives from a tiny location on the southern Tanzanian coast called Mingoyo, where in the late pre-colonial period, uh, there, there was quite a concentrated um, plantation complex. Um, and uh, the, the grandson of the last owner of these plantations still lives, oh, well, sorry, in 2000 still lived in the village. He's probably passed on. Um, now, colonial era sources tell us that the son of the last major plantation owner in this region uh, was made a local official by the British colonial government and in this role was very actively abusive um, he is remembered for doing things such as taking people away from funerals in order to, to do work for him, demanding their services in the middle of a meal, things like that. He, he was actively seeking to assert his continuing claim on the efforts of others in, in a very demonstrative way. Now, um, what happened after independence was that a plebeian Mingoyan um, accused this man of having called somebody a slave. Yeah? And at this point in, in the early 1960s, again, after independence, um, this owner's descendant, he was dragged to the local party office and made to apolog apologize publicly. And people who talked about this a good 40 years after the fact still clearly remembered the drama of it. <laughs> um, and it clearly came across as this man having met his comeuppance. Yeah? So in, in, in this case, um, it, it was plebeian slave descendant Mingoyans enforcing the prohibition on talking about slave descent against um, a 
the, the son of the former owner. Yeah? And they clearly thought of this as a kind of moral victory. Um, so what is evident in all of this is that it contrasts very strongly with what could be described as the standard model of addressing past injustices that is currently in use in many Anglophone contexts with a history of slavery. In the US, uh, universities are trying to trace the descendants of enslaved people who they auctioned off 150 and more years ago. Um, there are some efforts also in, in the UK to, I think in this case, it's more about seeing where the money went on part of the owners. Um, one could also cite the truth and reconciliation model that has been applied in various post-conflict situations across Africa, from South Africa to the Northern Ugandan civil war. In all of these cases, the basic assumption is that in order to move on from these abuses, these injustices, they have to be named first. They have to be made public. The victims have to be heard. The perpetrators have to, in, at least to some extent, acknowledge their role in these abuses. Um, and I've spoken to a colleague who is very involved with uh, post-slavery in the West African Sudan, who was very clearly of the view that what is going on in East Africa, again, reflects a continuing hegemony on part of slave owners. And this silence needs to be broken open. Yeah. Um, this view on the matter becomes even more complicated if we look at what's on this slide. So this is uh, on the Tanzanian mainland, the only artistic 3D representation of, of the history of slavery that I'm aware of. Huh? Um, it's, as you can see, uh, uh, represent, well, it's a slave caravan carved in wood the whole iconography corresponds quite closely to 19th century etchings, typically curated by missionaries uh, about uh, slave caravans in the East African interior. Now, um, Salvatore Nianto, the colleague who found this, uh, says that this was actually commissioned and paid for by a hotel owner, by a hotelier who had built a tourist hotel some 80 kilometers off the coast on what used to be the central caravan route in mainland Tanzania. Um, and he was hoping to thereby create essentially a tourist attraction. Yeah? Um, similar, if not quite as synthetic, if you will, attempt at memorialization are happening in southern, southern Kenyan coast with the so-called Shimoni slave caves. Uh, there are sites in from, from missionary settlements in, in Kenya that uh, memorialize the slave past. Uh, recently, I've heard a presentation about similar efforts along the Mozambican coast, also in the context of an effort to expand tourism. Um, this is, of course, nothing new. Uh, in, there's a number of sites in West Africa that are associated with some of the most hideous aspects of the West African slave trade, thank you, and that have long been tourist destinations. Nevertheless, um, it sort of makes my brain explode a bit. I, I find it very peculiar that uh, a confrontation with the history of, of slavery is treated as a day out, yeah, as somehow part of the package, a holiday package that typically includes a lot of sandy beach, yeah, 
and maybe some dances and carvings and, and things like that, and then slavery. Um, so where then, as somebody who is nevertheless trying to uncover this past and, and the way people in the East African region got from pursuing their emancipation to where they are today, um, it seems to me that it is crucial that no one model of dealing with the past be imposed on the communities living with these pasts. Uh, so perhaps the main question to ask here is how to make sure that the people who live with the heritage of slavery more or less on a daily basis remain the ones who get to define the terms of the debate. Yeah, that they do not have one or another model of examining this past just imposed on them, be it via their governments, via NGOs, or via economic incentives associated with tourism. Um, insisting on airing the dirty linen, so to speak, arguably would be a form of cultural imperialism in in these sites. Well, so it seems to me, I'll be happy to hear other views. Um, but at the same time, researchers dealing with these events do have to ask themselves how they can open spaces for discussion. Yeah? Whether or how it is possible to make hitherto unsayable things sayable, perhaps how to broaden ownership, so to speak, of such memory sites and draw hitherto marginal groups into the conversation. For a while, I was actually quite worried about whether raising these issues at all was poking a wasp's nest, that it, it maybe wasn't my job to poke. I took a little bit of reassurance recently from a discussion with a woman who works for the National Museums of Kenya, um, and who is herself of Omani descent, so constantly lives with this notion that she is a descendant of, of the privileged of the perpetrators. And she said that she thinks that the solution is to talk more, not less, to really have it out together. Okay, and with that, I'll end. No, 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 no. Felista. <laughs> you, you talk only. Yeah. Are oh, you want to show? Yeah. 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 Okay, let me press this. Oh, okay. mm. What do you need to show? I want uh, Adam. Oh, yes, I think we're going to I just actually say this. Uh, 
No, but they don't see that. No. It's okay. Habari za size jamani. Safi baada ya kusikia eneo kubwa la Kimombo sasa mimi nitakwenda kwenye Kiswahili moja kwa moja. Kwa hiyo sasa hivi wale ambao mlikuwa mnapenda kusikia Kiswahili mimi nitawasilisha kwa Kiswahili kwa kama una rafiki yako hapo karibu anajua Kimombo ama Kiswahili na wewe ujui ki, Kiswahili anaweza akaku akakupa tafsiri. Na sitatumia muda mrefu sana. <laughs> Nitakwenda polepole lakini kwa kuzingatia muda. Ah sitojitambulisha upya kwa sababu nilijitambulisha mwanzoni naitwa nani Malim Nash kutokea Dar es Salaam ni mwanamuziki wa hip hop lakini pia ni mkereketwa wa lugha ya Kiswahili kwa miaka tatu nimefanya album nyingi za muziki wa hip hop na kuhudhuria makongamano mengi na haya, haya ni mawazo yangu tu na, na, na ambayo nataka kuwasilisha hapa kuhusiana na e, kichwa kidogo kilikuwa na matatizo kichwa cha wasilisho ni mchango wa hip hop katika fasihi Tanzania ni, na, ni mahusiano ya utamaduni wa hip hop jinsi ambavyo e, inavyoshirikiana ama inavyotegemea zaidi e, fasihi e, Tanzania hususan kwenye ushairi wa hip hop uh, uh, fasihi lugha ya fasihi ni kwa utangulizi ni lugha ambayo waandishi ama watunzi hutumia ili kuficha wazo ama kutumia kwa njia nzuri ya kupendezesha au kuvutia hisia za msomaji kusikiliza uh, shairi lake ama wimbo ama kitabu chenye fasihi nzuri uh, kwa mfano mimi nilivutiwa na fasihi kwa ba, kwa kusoma vitabu vingi vya Hayat Shaban Robert lakini na mzee wangu Faruk Topan na vitabu vyake vyote na visoma na vitabu vingi sana vya kifasihi mimi ni mkereketo wa fasihi na hata nyimbo zangu zimejaa fasihi lakini mpaka usikilize eh siko YouTube unaweza kuzitafuta kiandika Malim Nash YouTube utanipata uh, pia hutumia taswira kama njia moja wapo ya kuficha kile kinachozungumzwa kwa hadhara Yaani hadhira itahitaji kutumia akili ili kuweza kubaini nini kinazungumzwa au kinakusudiwa. E, pia fasihi ni tofauti na mafumbo. E, lazima tufahamu mafumbo ni kitu kingine e, kwa sababu kumekuwa pia na shida ya watu kuona kama fasihi na mafumbo ni kitu kimo, ni kitu kimoja hapana. Fasihi ni eneo kubwa la kitaaluma. Uh, kwa nini <coughs> lugha hii ya fasihi kwa nini hip hop ama lugha hii ya fasihi ina, ina mchango wake ni upi kwa nini hasa fasihi kwa kuwa ni matokeo ya usanii wa lugha uh, lengo lake kuu ni kufikisha ujumbe fulani kwa jamii kuhusu masuala kadhaa yanayotokea au yanayoweza kutokea zipo kazi za fasihi zinazosikilizwa ama kutazamwa na kusoma kwa sababu fasihi ni sanaa inayoeleza au kuonesha maisha ya kila mwanadamu katika nyanja zote. Fasihi ni muhimu sana katika kuimarisha mfumo wa utambuzi wa fikra ama wa kifikra na kimtazamo kuhusu falsafa ya maisha na ulimwengu. Fasihi pia ni taaluma na sanaa inayofundisha namna ya kuikwamua jamii kutoka katika hali moja kwenda katika hali nyingine bora zaidi 
katika nyanja zote, nyanja zote za kimaisha. Hivyo basi dhima kuu za fasihi ni kutoa elimu burudani na hivyo kwenye mashairi ya hip hop ama nyimbo za hip hop kazi hizo kuu kazi zake kuu pia ni hizo kwa mfano eh, moja ya sehemu kubwa ambayo eh, fasihi eh, ama utamaduni wa hip hop unategemea sana mahusiano yake na fasihi ni sehemu ya kutengeneza tafakuri. E, mimi napenda kutumia neno jadidi mbele, mbele yake ama tafakuri jadidi. Niki kwa Kiingereza wanasema deep thinking sijui ndipo sahihi. <laughs> tafakuri jadidi. Ile tafakuri ya kina kufikiria kwa hali ya eh hivyo hiyo ni moja ya tafakuri ni, ni neno lenye kukusudia msisitizwa kufikiri huletwa na binadamu katika kutumia vyema akili yake ili kupata majibu ya maswali yaliyojitokeza au uamuzi kuhusu maisha au mengineyo ya namna hiyo kupitia kazi hizi unaweza kupata namna nzuri ya kutengeneza fikra pana kupitia muda unaojipa na inakupa hamu ya kutaka kujua kujifunza mambo na rejea eh, ama E, vitu ambavyo ni nyimbo ambazo nimezitumia ni nyimbo zangu mwenyewe ambazo nimeziandika na huu wimbo mmoja wapo kama mfano ambayo e, kuna mstari kidogo uta au wapo uh, kwenye wimbo unaitwa Tanzia e, hii ni albamu yangu mpya inaitwa Mhadhiri sheti yake ya e, Mhadhiri the Rector uh, kwenye wimbo wa Tanzia e, kuna mistari inasema mkono wa sheria umempokea Kaisali wakampitia haki kwenda kujivinjari wakitahamaki wanarudi nyumbani wamelewa chaka maana yangu hii wakati wimbo huu unatoka watu wanausikiliza kila mmoja alikuwa anataka kujua eneo hili hapa nashi umemaanisha nini lakini hapa ndipo tunapokuja katika ile hali ya kutengeneza tafakuri kutengeneza fikra mtu anapata hamu ya kutaka kujua ndipo na ndio maana nikasema kwamba mahusiano mazuri ama uhusiano kati ya mashairi ya hip hop na fasihi ama mchango wa hip hop katika fasihi ndio namna hii kwa maana ya kwamba mtu sasa anapaswa kujua hapa imetumika e, tamathali ya sehemu ya namna gani ama e, muundo wa lugha wa namna gani kwa maana ya kwamba inabidi ajue fasihi imetumikaje kwa, kwa, kwa haraka haraka tu naweza nikaichambua huu mstari nikauchambua mkono wa sheria umempokea Kaisali. Eh maana yangu ilikuwa ni kwamba namaanisha rushwa. Hapa nilijaribu kuonesha namna gani eh, mtu anapokea rushwa kwa maana ya kununua haki. Wakampitia haki kwenda kujivinjari. Baada ya kuchukua baada ya mtu kuchukua rushwa ili apate ili auze haki wao wakampitia haki mwenyewe wakaondoka naye wakaenda kulewa kwa maana ya kunywa pombe waliporudi wamelewa hakuna kilichoendelea kwa maana ya kwamba rush na, ni, 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 nilikuwa najaribu kuelezea namna ya haki inavyonunuliwa na mtu ambaye ana haki kuikosa haki hiyo ndio ilikuwa lengo langu la kutumia eh, mstari huu lakini sana sana nilikuwa nikimaanisha kwenye eneo la rushwa lakini pia <coughs> kazi nyingine ya fasihi eh, katika utamaduni wa ama katika nyimbo za hip hop ni kumlinda msanii. Fasihi imekuwa ni kiungo kikubwa baina ya waandishi wa, wa, wa mashairi ya hip hop kwa kutumia fasihi tumekuwa tukipata eh, uhuru ama tukua, 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 tunakuwa tunalindwa sana. Kwa sababu zipi? Kwa sababu uh, <coughs> kwa sababu uh, kwenye ulimwengu huu wa sasa ambao umejaa matabaka kati ya watawala na watawaliwa wenye nacho na wasio nacho na mengine mengi yenye kukinzana kuna haja kubwa ya kutumia kila njia ambazo nyingi haziwezi kuleta migongano au mikwaruzano ili kufikisha ujumbe au kile kinachokusudiwa kwa maana maana yangu ni ipi Uh, 
mara nyingi viongozi ama serikali nyingi huwa hazipendi kukosolewa sasa kuna namna ukitumia e, nyimbo wimbo wako au mashairi yako moja kwa moja huwa serikali nyingi zinaweza zikakukamata wakakufunga jela ama wakakushtaki ikao umeingia katika matatizo makubwa sana wapo waandishi waliokimbia katika nchi zao kukimbilia uhaibuni kwa sababu japokuwa muda mwingine fasihi hiyo hiyo unaweza ukaitumia wakasema hapana wewe umetusema sisi wakakukamata na bado wakakuletea mat- matatizo sana kwa mfano kuna wimbo wa msanii anaitwa Bokonya ni underground hip hop artist kutokea Tanzania aliandika wimbo unaoitwa Dereva Driver a uh, mashairi yake alikuwa akisema dereva huwa hapangiwi sikatai ila mwendo unaotupeleka ni mkali dereva tuwezi kuacha kulalama kwa maana tunafahamu tu, 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 kwa maana tuna, tunahamu kufika tukiwa hai dereva ni, anaweza kuwa dereva kama ka dereva mpo kwenye basi lakini dereva huyu ni kiongozi anaweza kuwa waziri mkuu rais wa nchi si ndio anaongoza dereva kwa hiyo kwa kutumia lugha kama hii kuna afadhali kuna kidogo unaweza uka, kiongozi anaweza kusema mkamateni lakini mkienda mahakamani mwanasheria anaweza kusema huyu kamaanisha dereva dereva wa kawaida tu kwa hiyo kesi hakuna kwa hii ni sehemu ya fasihi eh, ilivyo inavyotupa mchango wake mkubwa katika mashairi ya hip hop kwa maana tunapata uhuru wa kuandika kwa sababu tunajua fasihi ipo kwa ajili ya kutulinda Um, bado alikuwa anaendelea anasema najua tumechelewa hivyo inabidi tuwai lakini hii speed haifai kweli inawezekana kimaendeleo tuko nyuma na wewe kiongozi unataka kwenda na kwenda na uh, speed ya kwenda na haraka zaidi lakini speed yenyewe kama pengine ni kali sana kuliko nchi ilivyo kwa hiyo ni lazima tukubaliane kwa pamoja Okay. <clears throat> Na Lakini pia kuna eneo lingine eh, kukuza lugha kwa kuongeza misamiati au kuhuisha maneno. Eh, lugha kama chombo au njia ya mawasiliano inahitaji kukua siku baada ya siku kupitia mashairi eh, kuna maeneo kuna maneno ambayo yanatumiwa na huingizwa kwenye lugha eh, kwenye lugha yetu ya Kiswahili au ni maneno ambayo huwa yapo ila matumizi yake huwa kidogo hivyo mtu anaweza kudhani kuwa si neno la Kiswahili kuna wimbo wangu wa mwalimu Mashaka kuna mistari nasema eh, kidogo tu mwalimu Mashaka ni ni, 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 ni wimbo ambao ni, 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 ni hadithi ya kweli rafiki yangu alipangiwa shule za vijijini kulikuwa na changamoto maji umeme hakuna kwa hiyo alivoniadisia niliandika wimbo naitwa Mwalimu Mashaka sikutaka kumtaja kwa sababu ya sababu za kama nilivyosema kujilinda na yeye kumlinda lakini nilitumia picha ya kifasihi na jina lenyewe lilikuwa linaitwa Mwalimu Mashaka kwa <coughs> kwa jina la kikazi naitwa Mwalimu Mashaka kidato cha nne ufaulu sikupata nikasomea walimu niliona ni rahisi kuajiliwa haraka <coughs> Kwa kweli nilihitimu na nafasi nilipata nilipangiwa kwenda shule ya msingi Chaka iliyopo kijijini na uhaba wa madarasa. Hapa ilikuwa ni kuonesha kujaribu kuelezea mazingira magumu wanayopata walimu wanapopata ajira kwenye maeneo ambayo um, kwenye maeneo ambayo hayajaboreshwa kuanzia huduma za kijamii, mazingira ya kuishi au udogo wa mshahara na hivyo kuiomba serikali pia itathmini maslahi ya walimu. Lakini jina lenyewe Mwalimu Mashaka unaliona alipokwenda kufundisha ni chaka kwa maana ya mbali vijijini lakini mwalimu yupo kwenye mashaka na jina lake Mwalimu Mashaka. Kwa hiyo hiyo ndio sehemu ambayo naweza kwa muda uliokuwepo inaweza kwenda kufanya hitimisho kwa maana ya kwamba matumizi ya lugha ya fasihi yana <coughs> matumizi matumizi ya lugha ya fasihi ana faida nyingi kuliko hasara 
moja ya faida kubwa ni msanii kuwa huru kwenye tafsiri ya kile kilichozungumziwa inamjenga msikilizaji kuwa na tabia ya kufuatilia mambo au habari kwani bila kuwa mfuatiliaji sio rahisi kuelewa kinachozungumzwa au kukusudiwa kwenye ulimwengu huu sasa ambao wamejaa matabaka kati ya watawala na watawaliwa wengi nacho na wasio nacho na mengine mengi yenye kukinzana kuna haja kubwa ya kutumia kila njia ambazo nyingi haziwezi kuleta migongano au mikoruzano ili kufikisha kinachokusudiwa kwa hapa nimemaliza na hii ni sehemu yangu ya mchango wa hip hop katika fasihi Tanzania. Asante sana. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for staying and for being around. So the next presentation is actually wrong on your um <laughs> <laughs> on what you have so they will tell you what they're going to talk about and uh karibun <laughs> sorry okay. um, I need to if you want to get up and stretch in the meantime yeah. that's, that's a good idea <laughs> right <laughs> see people are waking up i'm doing yoga yeah a little bit <laughs> okay, see now then just this. don't leave, just stretch. <laughs> no, 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 where are you going? <laughs> see? What did you get the What did you get the bag? Okay, oh, so, coming back. yeah, Good. we can, uh, all right, welcome Lara, Stephanie, Kraus, Al Zaidi, and Irene Brunotti from Institute of African Studies, University of Leipzig. Welcome. Thank uh, you. Should we give them a second to come back? Look at me now. <laughs> uh, I'll never do that again. No, you know. Kwanza tutoe shukrani zetu za dhati kwa maandalizi ambao hawapo lakini vile vile kwa washiriki wote. Asanteni kwa kutualika ni mara yetu kwanza kuepo hapa SOAS. Um kwa hivyo Nianze tena na shukrani zetu kwa maandalizi tunakaribisha. <laughs> Hapa so asika mara yetu ya kwanza. Asanteni sana. Twende kazi. Yes, twende kazi. Uh yeah, so for avid abstract readers, they will have not a uh, will notice now that we will disappoint because uh, after seeing the program and after talking to Ida uh, two days ago, we actually decided that another thing that we have been thinking about in our work uh, a lot will uh, maybe fit much better here. And we would actually really love to hear your feedback on it. So uh, don't expect the abstract expect something else. Um, right, and we are actually very happy we did this because uh, throughout the whole day, there were a lot of presentations that will resonate a lot with uh, what we are going to focus on. And the one thing was uh, Jonathan's presentation in the morning on the postcards uh, of Zanzibar, where we already saw the British army bombing of the uh, House of Wonders uh, in Zanzibar, which we will pick up, basically. Um, and then Elspeth and Angelica were talking about uh, what might constitute a bit of a Swahili lens in terms of uh, more of a rhizomatic thinking. And a question that, that runs through our talk is really um, what constitutes the Swahili lens maybe, or like Swahili onto epistemologies? And uh, how can we do justice to them in the way that we think about, but also with language, right? Um, and then another thing, of course, that Ida was talking about the process of racialization, and uh, we will very much pick up on the role of matter, material, and also absenced material in uh, in racialization. And, and I think eventually, sorry, and silence, and and I think eventually we will also pick up on the unspeakabilities. Uh, that you just brought up. So, um, yeah, let's see. You have to click on the screen once and then, no, on the other one. And the other one. How do I get, just like that? Try it? Yes. yes. Okay, so a little bit of warning. Uh, in our presentation, there will be racializing matter, words, material, and pictures. <clears throat> 
Zanzibar siku ya Krismasi mwaka 2020 jumba la maajabu hadhi na fahari ya Zanzibar na wazanzibari tangu lilipojengwa limeporomoka machoni mwa ulimwengu mzima Maajabu were the many modernities electricity the lift the marble and the materials imported and local that the third Albu Saidi Sultan Sayyid Bargash brought into that house onto Zanzibar the city and his own reign Niliwaandikia washikaji wangu na familia yangu kuwapa pole zangu. Mmoja wao mshairi mwanaharakati na mwanahabari bwana Mohamed Halef Hasani alinijibu kwenye WhatsApp. Unajua watu hulizwa na miji na majengo yao kama walizwavyo na watu wao. Majengo na miji kwetu ina roho ya vutapumzi. In a language literary scholars are used to, Hasani uses first a simile, establishing a clear relationship of likeness between the houses, the cities, and the people that just after is enhanced through a metaphor. In this way, we would say the metaphor of soul and the metaphor of breathing anthropom anthropomorphize and personify the houses, likening them to people. Hata hivyo tukichambua kwa makini, kutoka katika uswahili, the houses are not personified, Hasani angalitaka to pers per personify them angaliandika wavuta badala ya yavuta ila hakufanya hivyo kwa hivyo tunahimizwa tusema tuseme kwamba the houses are actually breathing they literally have a soul um we'd like to get into a conversation with you today about whether a different reading of Hassani's words, for example, is possible. Uh, one that takes seriously, or first of all, actually brings to the fore, a Swahili onto epistemology that differs from West Western individualistic ontologies from which a literary vocabulary like metaphor is derived. And this speaks also to a conversation that I had with a Thai person, with Mze Abdelatif Abdallah and with um, Mze Farouk Topan, when uh, Zeh Farouk Topan was uh, talking about when he was called back to Dar es Salaam to open in 1968 to open up the institute, uh, the Taaluma Zaki Swahili. Here. And um, he was saying here in Dar we were discussing the literature in Swahili and we struggled with the terminologies in those early days, terminologies which would be meaningful to the context. So what we are arguing that um, here is that through translation of literary and not only analytic vocabulary such as metaphor in Swahili, a certain way of reading and interpreting language was mapped onto the Swahili context, importing Western worlding and suffocating possible readings kutoka kwenye uswahili. We here propose a metaphorical reading of Hassani's words and of different stories emerging from and through the collapse of the Yumbala Ma'ajabu. Such a reading refuses metaphorization and engages with the ontopistemological possibility of breathing houses with souls. So as to what metaphorics uh, would be, as you've noticed the word matter uh, replacing the meta, um, so whereas the concept metaphor is the trope of meaning transfer and substitution, as we're all familiar with, by means of analogy, matter for denotes the articulation of meaning in relation to matter. Uh, matter here is not understood as a fixed entity, but as constantly shifting, which is actually what phoric means and thereby establishing entanglements and relationalities. So if you hear us throughout our talk saying things that you would habitually hear as a metaphor, uh, we would invite you to search for their relation to the actual materialities that we are speaking. Um, this changes then not only how we conceive of the relation between meaning and matter, between words and matter, um, and consequently of knowledge production, but it also presents a different way of doing theory. So um, Gandalfa argues for a metaphorical use of language that will allow us to break loose from its rigid representative and metaphorical use. Thinking non-metaphorically, expressing despite language and reading signs non-imperialistically demands the abolition of all metaphor, and uh, she's quoting uh, Deleuze here, and the acceptance that all that consists is real. And what we are wondering and trying to enact throughout this talk is what this would look like, a non-metaphorical um, language. 
So a metaphorical language allows us to express material discursive relationalities without fixing individual separate comparable entities, which is the only way that you can make a metaphor work, right? Comparison and metaphor are only possible if you know what a house is and if you know what a person is, so then you can liken the house to the person. But by doing that, you are fixating what a house is and you are fixating what a person is. Um, and this is what we want to uh, refuse. So we want to put up for discussion that from within Uswahili, Madiengo, Midi, Watuna, Maneno are in fact ontologically co-constitutive becomings. Uh, and in our analysis outward from the collapse of Dumala Majabu, we try to enact um, metaphorical language. The wounded body of the house stands on the Forodani Gardens, Nikiwa Limepotezewa Haibayake, partially revealing its intimate interior interrupted. Bada ya miyaka mingi hiyo, ya kutumiwa na kutumwa. The coral stone has succumbed under the pressure of dense and violent times, of breathtaking salt pent up in the cracks, of mistreatment by those who were responsible for its well-being for roho yake. Nani mwenye jukumu? Yumba la maajabu limeporomoka, a sudden interruption, an intra-rupture, leaving an agonizing emptiness, a distressing urban void, a place in a state of suspension where a different form of control and structure are interrupted, making it difficult to fix and identify the void's identity. Matter is never a settled matter, Barat writes. Ne never, not even after it has fallen, we add. It's always already radically open, Barat continues. In a conference held two months after the collapse, the Zanzibari historian Abdul Sharif matters forth the constitutive becoming of the voided house of wonder and the wound of race in Zanzibar. Ali Vosema, this was not a collapse merely of one building. It was symptomatic of the decay that had set in the all of Zanzibar town since the revolution. It occurred almost immediately after yet another political catastrophe. A contentious election at the end of October with the usual casualties dividing the country once again and driving home the point, divided we fall. Here Sharif speaks the decay of the building uh, and of all of Zanzibar town into connection with the racializing political violence regularly erupting on the island since the revolution in 1964 that had overthrown the Sultanate. He hence with divided we fall which we could read as a metaphor in which these time people are likened to the house and their divisions to the collapse. However, we choose to attend to it metaphorically. The coral stone constituting much of the old town has from the late 18th century onward come to be racialized, mattering forth the racially divided Sisi Sharif speaks of. In Swahili discourses in Zanzibar, race in terms of skin color is not spoken. Blackness is worded as Wafrika, and the light skinnedness and whiteness of the rest is worded as Warabu, Uhindi, and the like. A linguistic void attempts to deny that bodies and skin can become matters of life and death in Zanzibar. But the coral stone divides the city, mattering forth silently racialized bodies. The stone mattered forth the Zanzibari rulers, wa Arabu, wa Germani, wa Ingereza, and traders, wa Arabu, na wa Hindi, as its righteous, righteous owners. The rest, wa Africa, therefore, were made to belong to Ngambo, the metaphorical other side of the old town. It's no coincidence that the old town of Zanzibar came to be named and known as Stone Town, the colonial proper and elitist space. And yet, the House of Wonders commissioned by the Sultan and mattering forth ruling light skin skinness, its coral stone touched by black hands, hands of enslaved bodies. Despite the violence mobilized again, the light skin wa Arabu in power in 1964 revolution by the Wazalendo, who mattered forth o Africa by appropriating a socializing colonial racial categories, and despite the post-revolution violences that Sharif words, the House of Wonders, mattering Uarabu, withstood. Leo kuporomoka kwake, this sudden erupting void with its desiring orientation toward being becoming innumerable imaginings of what might yet be have been, 
kunawezesha wazalendo kufuta historia ya utawala wa Kiarabu hatimaye na milele. Kwao the void becomes an opportunity to unmeta Arabness in its materiality, to let the city fall, Hassani tells us, and to eventually give it back to its self-proclaimed rightful owners, Black Zanzibaris. And divided we fall. Meta is never a settled matter, Barad writes, especially not after it has crumbled, we would add. It's always already radically open. The Jumala Mardabu had already become Jumala Ibu in the words of many Zanzibaris who had seen the first cracks, who had felt the stone trying to catch its breath. They were disappointed by the neglect of the house by the government. Its collapse is the material evidence of that neglect. Therefore, the government is committed to clear the rubble away. Yet what is it that must be cleared away? The wounded house crumbled into the multiplicity of materials of which it was made, fallen to the ground in a pile of rubble that re-members, puts back together what it was. All its racializing stone, its clay, lime, and wood crumbled. Matters dangerously hard to categorize. Matters so unsettled, so unsettling, that the government hurries up to sweep them away. It needs to govern unracialized single identity Zanzibaris. But Zanzibariness as rubble is not classifiable in order to be governable. It's a multiple, infinite, indeterminate identity that becomes problematic to the political power that needs to be avoided. Sweeping out the rubble is an attempt to push away, <laughs> mind you, not to stitch or even to heal the wound of race, to turn it into nothingness, to unracialize as part of an avoidance of responsibility. And divided we fall. But voids don't do nothingness, they undo no thingness. They don't unracialize, they unracialize. The unrubbled void is no doubt doing its own experiments with non-being. Indeterminacy is not the state of a thing, but an unending dynamism that can become differently in different relations with different bodies and different words. <laughs> Akizungumza na Bwana Hasani Profesa Sharif anatuarifu kwamba kwenye kifusi kuna hazina ambayo isingepatikana bila ya jumba kuporomoka. Hazina anayoyongelea ndio mbao zenye maandishi ya kidini ya Kiarabu yenye rangi ya dhahabu na kijini kijani ambazo zilikuwa zimetiliwa na Sultani Bargash nje ya veranda za jumba la maajabu. Sasa in the palace renovation following the white British army bombing meant to restore colonial power over the sultanate the British needed poles to support the house clock tower. Wenyewe walichukua ambao zile zile kujenga lo mnara, turned in such a way as to make their carvings invisible, literally disappeared from the sight of the colonialist and forcibly from the memories of Zanzibaris. Mtu yeyote akifanya vile vile, wewe utaonekana wewe mkatili kweli kweli wa historia, anasema mzee Sharif. Lakini British walifanya vile, wametumia zile mbao, wao walikuwa wanataka mbao plain. Today, the collapse offers the chance to recover that history, to remember, putting membra limbs back together, those planks. In a later email to us, Sharif writes, when the collapse occurred on Christmas Day 2020, I rushed to the House of Wonders, and later, urged one of the former colleagues to try to rescue any fragments of the boards. Voids are unending dynamisms of material discursive entanglements that move bodies, bringing Sharif to the site of the collapse for an attempt to intervene, to co-constitute what would for him and also for us be an ethical, responsible mattering forth of the voided planks. With Sharif and ourselves, the void then does not become ev evidence for shameful governmental neglect. Rather, uh, through its desiring orientation towards being and becoming, it expresses the multiple, infinite, indeterminate identity of a rainbow color people, opening up to the possibility for building, metaphorically, 
new and old unracializing material discursive relations vibrant with innumerable imaginings of what might yet be have been with possibilities for new and more just ways of interacting through a comprehensive Zanzibar response ability. And not divided, we don't fall. Unfortunately, Sharif told us, his former colleague had little say and uh, the debris was being dumped in the creek in front of Wawani Hotel. I'm sorry to say that none of it was recovered because the government was more concerned about the shame of the collapse than with salvation of what could be done. But matter is never a settled matter, Barat writes, even after it was absenced, we add. It's always already radically open. About the planks, we only learn through Sharif's words in the interview after the collapse. It was the void, Sharif and his words becoming with each other that brought forth these planks into the public domain so we could pick them up. After we referenced his words from the interview to him and asked him if he had anything for us to work with, he shared pictures he had taken of the violated planks hidden in the clock tower when the Jumbalama Jabu still stood. However, looking closely at the pictures, trying to piece together the words and their meaning with my husband who speaks Arabic, thankfully, what struck us the most were not the worded planks as signs or their meaning, but more wounds. While we had already heard Sharif speak of the planks having been turned so as to hide their carvings from view, we hadn't sensed the cuts, the violation of these Arab word bodies cut into pieces by the British. So you can see on that picture that these long planks were actually cut at several points to literally build the fundament of the, um, of the clock tower. Voids created within wooden words, making them hard to remember. On Christmas Day 2020, the clock tower built from mutilated, violated words eventually broke down, scattering its limbs. Broken, material discursive, violated, light-skinned Arab ancestors, co-constituents of, in Sharif's words, a rainbow-colored people, remembered with and through the void. And divided the planks for. So uh, what we asked ourselves is how we can remember the words of the House of Wonders. And uh, we actually managed to piece together two of these cut pieces uh, from the pictures that, that Sharif sent us. And uh, it is the Surah 3, Ayat 26 of the Quran. And uh, we'll just play that little excerpt if hopefully it works and end with that. <laughs> And ten. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, okay. Okay, so we're calling our uh, last presenter, our own SOAS uh, student. Um, uh, please join us. I just put up your presentation. Uh, you lost. <laughs> Okay, this one and this. Uh, did you send me a final one just now? Yeah, yeah. By email. Yeah. All oh, right. So let me just open it. I need to open my email again. Uh, okay, don't stop sharing. Um, 
Uh, yes. While we're waiting for this to open, Tom can give us a yeah. quick uh, announcement. For uh, anyone who's interested, we will be going to the College Arms, which is like a two minute walk away on Store Street. Um, we'll obviously all go together. So <laughs> 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 and I'm going to be going to join later. <laughs> Uh, it's the college arm. Um, and I'm saying that you just turned left. Out the Brunei Gallery. Out this building. Left. And then it's the third okay, right. This is the third right. So you can really move the office. Yeah. College arm stores. We'll be going to bring that to us. Yeah. And right now we have Retapile and Inessa. Let's do it. 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 Let's do Tom, Franco. Sì, sono lei. E che dove sei? Eh, sono cresciuto a Bologna, ma mia mamma è di Bologna, mio padre è di Salerno. Ma dai, che forte, ma sei nato a Londra. Sì, tu invece? Io sono Val Giustana. Ah, va. Wow. Presente? Sì. Non sai dov'è? Sì, sì, sì. <ride> eh. Ok, adesso sì, perché mi hanno detto di far perdere due o tre minuti perché devo andare alla la, la, la Uh, aspetta, eh, no, perché questo è un po' il tuo. Secondo me si fa, si fa Aspetta, ma mi sei tutto di me, sicuro? Perché vado qui e poi la metto lì. Sì, sì, sì. Posso scusare? Vai, vai. Eh, ma sicuro che sei tutto di me. Ecco, vedi? Devi venire tu da mia mamma. Monthly meet up here at SAS for London Swahili speakers. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, we meet monthly at SAS um, to speak Swahili, everyone from outside, students, Um, yeah, there's chai and things. So, yeah, if you're interested in that, then, yeah, maybe ask me and I can give you the WhatsApp link. Yeah. And college arms, for those of you that didn't hear the first time. No, I saw your email. I don't want, my email op I don't want the opening it because it might, it might beep. Yeah, you can close that. This one? Yeah, I think so. No. Oh, no, there was ours. Oh. It's okay, no problems. No, no, it's okay. Okay. Mm. That was wrong, but I don't know. Let's start again. Let's start again. Let's start again. No. Okay. Okay. We can start? Yes. And then we'll come on going. We'll 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 Yeah, instead of you, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so um, okay, so we are now starting the presentation of Thomas Mayo Franco. Thank you. You got uh, 15 minutes. Okay, 15. okay. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Tom. I, uh, I graduated from SOAS in Development Studies last year, and I'm here now doing my Master's in African Studies. And uh, today I'm going to be some do something a little bit different from the rest of like the presentation today. And uh, I'm just going to present my like independent study project. My So this presentation is based on my undergraduate dissertation and is about like uh, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on um, HIV care services in Tanzania and how people living with HIV in Tanzania like um, uh, the struggle during the COVID pandemic. So uh, when uh, when the COVID nineteen outbreak outbreak like hit Africa, um, of course, like it was a very delicate situation, because uh, like uh, um, there was a collision between like uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, and ongoing uh, like medical challenges and epidemics uh, such as like tuberculosis, malaria, uh, and of course like uh, um, HIV AIDS, uh, which is like what we're gonna talk about today. So uh, my study um, is focused on the perspective like of uh, uh, community healthcare uh, NGOs that work both in Tanzania mainland uh, and Zanzibar. And uh, yeah, um, as my primary research, I interviewed like uh, 
um, members, uh, different members of like uh, uh, these three NGOs. And uh, here I actually like uh, have to thank like the Swahili Meetup uh, crew because uh, um, I was messaging like uh, on the group chat uh, and I and they really helped me to identify like uh, key like a community healthcare organization that worked on the territory and like uh, during the pandemic as well. And so uh, the idea here is that like I wanted to bring like different experiences to my study. Uh, so like for instance, the first one is the Zanzibar Association with people living with HIV AIDS and uh, uh, talking with them like really helped me to like understand like uh, the different experience between uh, Zanzibar and Tanzania mainland. Uh, and the second one is the next of women living with HIV AIDS in Tanzania. And like uh, with them, like I was able to uh, explore from the perspective of like a vulnerable group, like uh, women living with HIV. So in terms of secondary research, uh, um, I started by like uh, understanding like uh, how COVID-19 impacted Tanzania uh, and like uh, other like East African states in general. And then uh, I narrowed down to the relationship between COVID and HIV um, in, uh, in Tanzania. And like this, looking at other like East African state or like at other African state in general really helped me to like uh, uh, highlight recurring challenges uh, that I could have expected uh, during my study. So um, my methodology has the, uh, some limitation because uh, like uh, I wasn't, um, I didn't include any like uh, official like governmental sources. Um, because like, first of all, get, getting access to the sources is very like time consuming and like it requires a lot of permissions. Uh, and secondly, um, the government, like the Tanzanian government didn't release any official um, COVID like data or report uh, after May 2020. Um, and so like I decided to focus on the experience of community uh, of HIV care NGOs. Uh, and uh, I think like, uh, uh, since we have like a lot of official data, uh, the seeing the perspective still made the study relevant. So my study uh, begin with uh, two predicted outcomes. The first uh, is uh, that like uh, uh, a reduction in public investment uh, in HIV care, like in the Tanzanian territory, uh, will have like increased like the economic pressure on local HIV care NGOs uh, that needed to like support people living with HIV. Uh, throughout the global pandemic. Um, and the second was that there were challenges uh, like uh, in like initiating like a new patient uh, to antiretroviral therapy uh, due to disruption to testing facilities. And um, later on, I'll expand on both of them. So uh, as we probably already know, um, when the COVID-19 uh, COVID arrived in Tanzania, um, President Magufuli, former President Magufuli actually, um, really don't play like the pandemic. And so like uh, uh, they left to like, avoid, it, avoid the lockdown measure, they left the business open. Um, and uh, so like uh, the situation was really concerning. Um, and so um, this like uh, neglect of like, uh, um, neglecting of the severity of the global pandemic that um, Tanzania was like facing like other countries, uh, pose a threat to like the lives of like 1.7 million of Tanzanians living with HIV, uh, and so like uh, uh, this increased the pressure on like uh, uh, HIV care NGOs to like support people living with HIV um, throughout the pandemic. Because yeah, so the first thing that came out uh, uh, with my research uh, is that actually like uh, there was like uh, a very different experience in terms of like co COVID containment policies in Zanzibar and in Tanzania mainland. Um, in fact, uh, uh, President Hussein Ali Mwini, uh, the president of Zanzibar, um, had uh, like a, a very different reaction compared to Magufuli. And in fact, like um, uh, despite Zanzibar, like relies, uh, Zanzibar economy relies a lot on tourism, um, President Mwini was aware of the, um, of like the state of like, uh, healthcare services uh, and like the economic capabilities of the country. And so like, uh, um, you really didn't want uh, like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic to have like uh, a destroying impact uh, on like uh, the Zanzibar economy. Um, and so like uh, he introduced like stricter lockdown measure than like Tanzania mainland, uh, including like travel restriction, border closes, 
and stuff like that. And um, the second thing that like um, um um came out of my research is that like uh, um when um the 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 reduction in like uh, governmental and uh, intergovernmental fundings uh, to like uh, HIV care programs uh, um required of course like uh, a, a big push from the private sector that like supports like uh, these NGOs and like um every like uh, participant in my study uh, they actually said that like uh, uh, they didn't have like uh, uh, very negative economic consequences due to COVID because like uh, uh, the, 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 the decrease in public funding was actually supported by like an increase in like private source of funding that like uh, helped uh, like to adapt the services like uh, and becoming that making them like uh, COVID-19 compliant and like uh, allow them to like um, uh, keep doing like uh, their services and support people with living with HIV throughout the pandemic. And uh, this was very interesting because I was expecting uh, to like, um, mm, I was expecting that, that this like reduction in investments in public investment will have had a negative impact, but it actually didn't. Um, of course, like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic brought like uh, new challenges and uh, like uh, HIV care, like NGOs uh, needed to readapt uh, uh, the, um, the the way like they deliver like uh, uh, treatment uh, and like Tanzania was actually like a, a very good example where like uh, compared to other East African countries where like um, uh, local NGOs like uh, really managed to readapt well to the pandemic in terms of like uh, delivering uh, um, treatments. Um, in fact, like uh, um, Tanzania ensured like successful access to HIV treatments to most of like people living with HIV, both in rural and urban areas. Um, and uh, like this process was helped by like a shift in policies. Uh, in fact, like um, 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 the government allowed like a six month antiretroviral mental medicine dispensing, which means that like uh, uh, people living with HIV could like uh, uh, collect drugs for like six months and um, and uh, and basically like not having to worry about uh, and not having to go like regularly outside their house and stuff uh, and being therefore like more exposed to COVID. Um, and like um, um, the delivery of like uh, antiretroviral mental therapy um, is like, uh, um, it was essential to uh, keep it like going because like uh, uh, people living with HIV need to take antiretroviral mental therapy and which is uh, like a combination of like three drugs, I believe, uh, that if are taken every day, like uh, they make like um, uh, HIV in the blood almost undetectable and people uh, can, link, like, can live like a normal life as long as they keep taking the drug regularly. Um, and uh, also like uh, another thing that like uh, really helped uh, like uh, uh, ensuring the access to like uh, um, antiretroviral ther therapy uh, is that like uh, in the last few years, uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy has been like uh, given for free to people living with HIV. Um, and this means that like uh, even like those people that uh, were affected negatively economic by the COVID-19 pandemic were uh, still like able to um, access the treatments. Um, one uh, of the negative impact of the COVID pandemic, uh, it was that like uh, it, it caused like a lot of issues in uh, diagnosing uh, new cases. Uh, in fact, uh, like a lot of like uh, uh, HIV testing ser uh, testing centers uh, uh, were like uh, closed during COVID or like uh, the medical um, uh, staff that was working there was like displayed to like uh, um, COVID-19 facilities. Uh, and therefore like uh, people living with HIV or that weren't aware of their status uh, had to travel more to get tested uh, and uh, to, and it means that they were more exposed to COVID. Um, and also like uh, another factor that the negative impact uh, on, um, new on new diagnosis is the fact that um, the, um, the, some HIV tests are like antigen, like the COVID test. And so like uh, an increase in demand of like a COVID test uh, that were produced um, from like uh, Western pharmaceutical companies uh, meant that like uh, there was like a lower supply of um, a HIV tests because uh, they're very similar. <laughs> and uh, also like the COVID-19 pandemic uh, brought it like uh, 
some uh, other uh, challenges that like uh, indirectly impacted the like uh, uh, maybe didn't directly impact the HIV care services, but still had an indirect impact uh, on like the life of millions of people living with HIV. And um, one of the things that uh, my the participant in my research highlight is that like uh, the um, the the closure of like uh, support groups uh, uh, was uh, particularly bad. Uh, in fact, like a lot of people uh, uh, living with HIV um, are like uh, very relying on like the support groups where they can meet each other and like uh, talk, like support each other. Uh, and this is particularly important for women living with HIV because like uh, um, Tanzania is still a country where like uh, there's a lot of so social stigmatization, especially like concerning women. And so like uh, the, the stop uh, of like uh, support groups uh, had a negative impact on the mental health of like many people living with HIV. And uh, the second thing I mentioned here is like food security, because like uh, um, my participant reported that like uh, uh, food security in mainland Tanzania remains stable, uh, but in Zanzibar actually like uh, there were like uh, uh, a lot of increases in prices of like imported food, uh, and so it means that like uh, people are, like uh, uh, it made it harder for people to access nutritious food, and this like uh, had a negative impact uh, on the adherence to like um, antiretroviral th therapy because like uh, having a nutritious diet uh, means that like uh, uh, when you start taking the drugs uh, like uh, the drugs are gonna start uh, like having effect more quickly so finally uh, the outcome of my studies uh, revealed that like uh, my hypotheses were partially confirmed so like uh, uh, the as i was saying before like uh, um, the financial challenges uh, for like HIV care as NGOs uh, were kind of supported by, were kind of like uh, compensated by like an increase uh, in private sector fundings. Uh, uh, but um, also like uh, the um, hypothesis about like uh, um, difficulties in initiating like a uh, new patient to antiretroviral therapy was confirmed as like a disruption in testing facility, like uh, making harder to get like uh, uh, many people uh, on the drugs. Asante Sana. Asante Sana, thank you so much for um, these amazing presentations. I learned so much. And I think we had something like three threads going uh, through this panel, which was the, our biggest panel. So can I take some uh, questions from the audience? Yes. Um, because just yesterday it was announced that the African Union and the Caribbean community will collectively seek reparations for slavery together with their translations and official apologies. So I wonder how we see that in the whole day, dynamic or how we see perhaps those who want to move forward without addressing the past and those who prioritize um, justice. Definitely, yes, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, well, interestingly, in Tanzania too, there has just been a debate about an apology that has happened recently, but that was when the German president went to apologize for war atrocities committed during the Madi Madi uprising in 1905-2007. Um, and the responses from the Tanzanian colleagues have been mixed with especially academics, especially historians saying it's not very far enough, but especially it's evident that what happened there was clearly an attempt to apologize without pain. I thought that in a way that, that was perhaps the whole point of uh, the exercise from the German perspective. Um, so implication being that the debates on uh, res restorative measures of a financial form are currently focused elsewhere. Yeah. Um, every time there is a debate on reparation for slavery, uh, it does resonate to some extent in East Africa, but none of the governments really take it up with anything like the seriousness that exists currently, especially in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's 
in a sense, the well, capability is more disseminated, right? I mean, you'd have to really address European nations that facilitated the trade, such as the French, the Germans, you'd have to address uh, governments in the Arabian Peninsula, as far as Iran, really. Um, I think it's actually currently not a priority, not for any, anyone, not, not even for the, the sort of people who are having conversations about how to live with this heritage in village, in, in very local settings. Yeah. Because I, if only because I don't think anybody realistically expects money to become available. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other question or comment or anything? Yes, um, Babatun, and then the person behind you. Sorry. Sorry, for me, for Ne, <laughs> 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 Lakini kwa upande wa wa sisi mimi ni mshairi ambaye naweza kusema natumia zaidi ya mashairi kitaaluma pia. Kwa hiyo huwa natafuta namna ya kuliweka shairi vizuri kwa sababu nina watoto. <laughs> kwa hiyo muda mwingine naweza nikapelekwa ndani ukakosa msosi kidogo. <laughs> Sasa nahitaji kutumia fasihi vizuri ili ni, ni, niweze kufikisha ujumbe vizuri. Kwa hiyo Isiye peke yake wako wasanii ambao yuko hata Roma eh, hata mimi niliwahi kunikuta mwaka 2014 nilitoa wimbo unaitwa Kaka Suma ni jina la kifasihi nilikuwa nataka kusema Sumatra Sumatra ni ni shirika nilo yuzni mamlaka ya usafirishaji kuna mwaka 2015 eh, nauli zilipanda sana za usafiri wa umma Mimi nikaandika wimbo kutetea wananchi lakini katika mfumo wa kifasihi lakini <laughs> serikali iliweza kugundua ya kusema hapana hii umetusema sisi kwa muda mwingine wao wanalazimisha kuona kwamba hapana japokuwa umesema kakasuma kakasuma anaweza kuwa sumaili sababu ismaili ni kifupi cha suma kwa ilienda shida walifungia wimbo huo na wakanipa jina la mchochezi Kwa hiyo ipo muda mwingine huwa wanaingia moja kwa moja wanasema ya kukua mitumia fasihi fasihi ya kusisi. Kwa wimbo maake radio zinambiwa wa wakati. Ndiyo wali mimi wimbo wangu ule diyo zote zinitangaziwa hakuna kupigia wimbo wa kakasuma wa nashi wa mali nashi. Na ilikuwa kanidia mwaka mzima wa miaka gada na ukweza kuwa. Lakini kwenye mitanda huko. Ya. Yeah. <laughs> Mashkuru. Sante san. And it was behind you, yes. And then we'll come back here. Uh, 
novels or works, and whether that's a good comparison to the works like uh, Tom's Lord Utopia, whether they're, they're very different, because that's something that I've been uh, very good in the Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. And um, I have read uh, Julius Nianena's translation of Shakespeare, but I cannot say I studied it. Uh, however, I think uh, the translation he adopted was more than simplification, uh, but um, it's actually a strategy uh, influenced also by ideology, by the socialist ideology. We can find that, um, especially the Venice merchants, right? uh, I, well, I don't recall its name well. In this play, uh, we can say that uh, Nierele um, describes uh, great, uh, the greedy man or the uh, avaricious is as uh, not not good enough, not good enough in uh, socialist ideology. And uh, actually, it, it, in the original play, I believe uh, it was not so fierce against this uh, kind of uh, avaricious uh, deeds or, or something like that. So in his uh, translation, he tried to change this play in the uh, socialist context to make it better align with the so socialism that he wanted to carry out. Uh, and I think this is what I could answer for now. And I don't know if I can <laughs> Uh, in terms of uh, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, in, sorry, Julius Nirelli, Julius Caesar, Mabipari, uh, may I just add one more thing to this? And that is, uh, we take this in the context of both translations, that is Julius Caesar and Mabipari, and both have been spoken about in terms of how Nirelli who was trying, in a sense, to bridge uh, going from capitalism to Yama, uh, like. So that's just one. There is an article by somebody called Devji, uh, and it talks about Shakespeare. I forget the reference, but it is D E D J I, Faisal. Faisal, his first name is Faisal Devji. He talks about this. Perhaps you might just want to, you know, to look him up. Um, since I have the, the may I speak also about not only this question but two other things. Yes, please, please do. Okay. In terms of utopia, again, there is an article by Said Ahmed Muhammad, and uh, he's speaking specifically on Sadiqika, and he seems to sort of uh, agree with the idea that uh, uh, Sadiqika is moving towards this utopian uh, genre uh, as such. And, and um, my, my take on that is that that is partly what we saw, but partly we need to credit Shaban Robert also with the creativity of the way that he is portraying the whole idea of uh, uh, being here, not only Uta uh, Alamora, uh, uh, I think uh, you had a sentence on that. Uh, I, I would, I would perhaps rephrase it differently. That he, will, he the reason why Shabban Robert could not come in openly to, to criticize the colonial uh, regime was precisely what I said. That he was a civil servant, and life uh, went here. He had to come out of that. That uh, he did support. African Association, etc. Mali, Tanzania. Here I am a fungo in the Tukurkisha of Alimanzo. The Nimbos are Tarat. Zina Mafungo, that Mafungo Yake, Nikama Yako, Zakini, Yana, Yulitana, Nadiami. Nadiami, you can't suppose who seek one and can do it. The heading of the play in my play 
by me, you have. It has been transmitted in, in various ways. The, the head has been sort of passed around. They have president, who will not president, who will not president, who will not So there is that. Uh, um, we go to the presentation, uh, uh, your presentation. Uh, thank you for that, because I think this is a subject which needs to be uh, spoken about, as you say. But I would like to transfer it to another uh, subject. And that is, a few years ago, I was approached by a journalist, uh, I think some of you know her, Yasmin Alibai Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, look, I'm going to Zanzibar. I'm going to uh, make to have, make a documentary and on a very important subject. And I, we talk about it. So I said, what's the subject? And again, it was uh, slavery. And I said, that's very important. Uh, but, but because you're going to Zanzibar, take that opportunity to talk about something else. Because since 1964, uh, there has not been any truth and reconciliation uh, commission in Zanzibar. And yet, people have lived with all these years knowing fully well who has tortured whom and who would. So there is that unspoken aspect in Zanzibar itself. I don't know whether I'm right here, but still there. But, but that aspect needs to be addressed as well, because that that really uh, was very, very, many Zanzibaris feel very raw about what had happened then. But again, of course, it is, it is time and so on. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. There was a there was a hand somewhere. Yes, Rachel. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question to um, really a bit of an observation to bring uh, really on um, on the idea of literary uh, modernity on this sort of um, middle center, which is translation and not necessarily the, the initial literary expression itself in terms of like testing literary modernity setting on translation. I wanted to, to sort of ask um, like the difficulty of uh, talking about modernity itself and, the, the, and translation itself as a tool of uh, modernity or modernizing, but also concept of time and the form and the style and the thematics of the expression, the initial expression of the text. And from the point I'm talking from a, a very uh, Africa-centered uh, point of view, that necessarily translating across from uh, a European text back into uh, the African text. Uh, and I'm imagining texts uh, that um, sort of imbue that literary, literary uh, critique and express in the Swahili language and uh, embodying thematically, stylistically, in terms of form, that which we could refer to uh, as this uh, literary modernity in, in, in terms of placement. The second question that is uh, tying up to the beginning of your presentation is this, uh, I'm getting into, I'm beginning to learn uh, translation theory uh, this year for my research. I'm going to read it. The, I used to be extremely angry with classical text in the beginning that would be translated wrong. I used to feel very curious about why the translators take so many liberties. But this year I'm becoming softer, and I, I, I don't like that. <laughs> softer because I, I, I'm a very loyal person to the prose, the fiction as it's produced there, the, the text like the literature, uh, the, the, the drama. Uh, um, the, 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 the writer goes through that, that creation. The question I am struggling with now, which I don't know if it's an observation or a question I'm asking you, but it's related to the first part of your presentation, is this question of who or what is the translator translating? Are they translating for the receiving culture? Or are they, which way are they translating? themselves if they are this close to the receiving culture they're translating themselves through a text or are they translating for the reception 
or something that has slightly nothing to do with it. I, mean, I, 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 I think I, I had uh, your idea of the, the corruption and the sort of bastardization of the text sometimes. What happens when the translator is really just concerned with the receiving culture and themselves, if they're close to the to the target? <laughs> the, the, the text itself, and, and, and this I find, I, I don't know, I, I, I find my beef with translators getting, I'm getting softer, but I'm getting even more angry. <laughs> when I realized like, they actually are uh, theoretical uh, mechanics that allow them yeah. to do this kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if I expected this question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, well, actually, regarding the second question, um, I would like to know that you want to know the translators' attitudes or uh, something like that towards the receiving culture or. No. <laughs> Uh, your your concern, and I, I respect the concern, was that the the colonial translators were translating with the misunderstanding and the paternalization of the receiving culture. An extreme uh, end when the, the translator is with the culture and respectful and respectful towards it, and still uh, translate something that is not the text. But that is, no matter how respectful it is for the, the, the culture, that is themselves in the culture. Can yes. I actually say? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Let's say they're not colonial. I'll tell you what, maybe if I can just quickly interject, I think what she means is, um, I think we normally find that translators maybe sort of, so let's say with authors who are writing, for example, in English, would be writing for a global audience. And so they are free to write maybe for whoever. But I think when you're translating, for instance, into Swahili, you're very aware of the audience, sort of like, who's going to read this? Can they accept this or not? And I think in the colonial times, it was more so the case because the script had changed, right? I mean, from the Arabic to the Latin. So they needed some readers. So it was quick translations, isn't it? But then there was also patronizing that happened. Like, for example, why make Alice into a little African girl? You know, so that's what she's asking. Are they allowed to do that or or not? And I think we have to be aware of time. Uh, so go on. <laughs> well, actually, in my opinion, or from my yeah, perspective, which is unequal power relations, I mentioned before, I think uh, they actually, uh, from a perspective of normal translators, they were not allowed to do, to do that. Uh, however, uh, in colonial context, uh, the power it may be uh, in my opinion is the is the central is the central point in the whole translation process and uh, the maybe I think the, the knowledge or, and the discourse uh, was constructed by power um, yeah from my from my perspective uh, so I think they uh, were originally not allowed to however they were is uh, they could decide everything because they were dominant in everything and in, in the whole process, they were dominant. They were, there were no others uh, restricting them, right? They, uh, for example, uh, the publishers. Uh, we could say that uh, King Solomon's Lines uh, was reprinted, was reprinted uh, well, maybe more, more times than, than the Gulliver's Travels. Uh, but there's actually there's um, yet no one to question why this phenomenon exists. Why King Solomon's mice uh, are uh, reprinted for uh, maybe for several times uh, instead of Budapest travels. So in my opinion, actually, I think um, maybe King Solomon's mice represents the colonial ideology and discourse and it fits well it fits perfectly with the colonial discourse right it uh, portrays the what mass the gods and the saviors and uh black um uh, africans should be subject to them uh so i think i just uh, my guess i think it's the reason why it was reprinted several times and uh, uh, maybe in in nowadays uh, translation, if we uh, take a look at the translation process uh, for now, we can say that um, publishers have their say. 
But during the colonial time, they didn't have their say. It, it should be a multifaceted negotiation engaged by different people, by different stakeholders. However, it was only engaged by the British translators themselves. Uh, for example, the uh, Inter-Territorial Language Committee. It was in the central, and uh, actually, it can it can make uh, any decision uh, instead of asking uh, asking advice or receiving some restrictions from uh, other parties. All right, thank you very much. I have to thank the panel. Thank you. So this is the panel that has come from uh, Germany, Tanzania, China. Belgium and Tanzania and um, all around England. So honestly, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, okay, before I invite uh, Professor Wangui Wagoro to give us um, sort of like um, the, the closing remarks, I just want to say that next year will be year 10 for Baraza. And we think it's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so sort of like we're throwing ideas around sort of like we'll contact you obviously but we're thinking of maybe at last having a publication uh, of what was presented here this year but even in previous years so we'll contact our speakers and see if we can have something for Baraza at least that's one thing and also if you have any ideas of us sort of like having this two-day um conference at last maybe sort of i mean let us know how we can do it how you want to be involved i think you'll be fantastic but thank you so much everybody thank you everybody who helped with the food um i mean everybody just came in Pfizer, it's appeal everybody just went in and helped and it was just amazing you're all such amazing waswahili asante ni sana <laughs> Asante ni sana ni furaha yangu kubwa kuja kuwashukuru kwa kutofika hapa leo. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today. I think we should first congratulate Professor Farouk who was recognized this year and the best place to applaud him clearly is Barazi. Secondly, I'd like to thank Ida, Dr. Ida and um, um, Angelica Bashiri for the hard convening of a conference. It's not easy, but thank you so much for having us here. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers and helpers because behind the scene to these wonderful people that you see, there are many others who are holding them up and ensuring that this uh, wonderful conference does happen. We can applaud at the end so that we can <laughs> so we can move quickly because I know that you're very tired. I want to thank all the panelists. I found all the papers really moving, healing, extending, challenging. You know, all emotions, and I'm sure that you all traveled through so many emotions. The fact that this is living history, the buildings, we're in the middle of resolving this African slavery that happened. We're in the process of dealing with a global slavery. We're in the middle of major wars that are world shifting. We're going through a seismic shift with artificial intelligence and such like. So this moment is so important. And we did focus a lot on the Eastern African region, which is, of course, the home of Kiswahili. We went to Congo, we went to the ocean, we went to Tanzania, we went to Europe. And our hip hop person reminded us to Kohapa, London, to Menda Ulaya. <laughs> The genre representation, we had different forms from lyrical to the hip hop, you know, the whole, the very scientific, dry, methodologically sound and all that. So it's a learning process, even for us as scholars. I don't want to give you a presentation, which I could. <laughs> 
But as Ida said, it would be wonderful. I remember when Baraza started 10 years ago, I could never envisage that it would grow into this magnificent. I found the quality of these papers very high. So I think a retrospective publication would be a great idea to celebrate the 10 years. I'd written so many things that I wanted to say, but I won't bore you with them because you were all here. But we do have people online who stayed with us the whole day. We'd like to thank them and to urge you to come physically next year. It's a very important day. Start saving your fares and applying for funding. And let's all meet here, hopefully for two days is my wish. Um, and I'd like to thank all the moderators who facilitated the, 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 the wonderful conference and for all of you for coming and staying and staying and staying. That's the joy of every conference to have an audience, uh, whether you're presenting, whether you're listening, whether you're facilitating, the joy of a conference is having you who stay till the very end. Some people missed what was said, but I understand it's live, going to be live on YouTube. I will take an opportunity myself to watch some of it again. I was tempted many times to step in on many of the issues, but I had to restrain myself because I knew that I had these minutes at the end of the day. But all I can say is asanteni sana, kwaherini, tunawashkuru nyote, asanteni.